This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. Good morning. It's three minutes after ten. There is, I like these modern phrases that people invent to uh, describe burgeoning phenomena. I just want compassion fatigue is one of them. But I, I don't know quite what the word is for the diminishment of interest in industrial action the longer it goes on. So uh, they all suffer from it. If, if they bed in for a, for a long fight and the government for reasons that often remain quite opaque but are probably pretty sinister, they um, I, I, I lose well, coverage. Lo- I don't know if we lose interest. It depends on whether you're closely associated with the action, doesn't it? Whether or not your train journeys are being affected or whether your operations are being postponed. But the... But the level of interest obviously diminishes the longer the action goes on. And that is probably why the unprecedented doctor's strike that begins today, a a six-day strike that is obviously going to cause quite a lot of disruption, although it's important to remember that the NHS now habitually and routinely has to postpone operations because of uh, 13 years of underfunding and chronic, chronic uh, staff shortages, not to mention, of course, uh, continuing retention and recruitment issues, all of which constitute reasons why junior doctors are going on strike. I, I, to me, this is not a morning when I remind you that to be in support of every single strike that is ever undertaken is almost as silly as being opposed to every single strike that is ever undertaken. The diminished, the decline, the epic decline in the NHS since David Cameron became Prime Minister in 2010 and embarked upon an ideological programme of stripping public services of support because, well, uh, in short, because his mates, cronies and supporters didn't make enough money out of the NHS as it was then, has hobbled a once magnificent institution. Uh, make no doubt about that. I'm also not, I'm afraid, of the view that sustaining it in its current situation, in its current status, is absolutely essential, n- never mind possible. But the but the ideological move to dress up an, uh, an assault upon the country's population as, as, as necessary austerity has led us to where we are now. And uh, the people who've suffered the most in some ways, are the people who would be least likely to object. It's funny, isn't it? You put up taxes, you talk about inheritance tax, which affects a tiny, tiny proportion of the population, but it affects the loudest, most powerful proportion of the population. You talk about inheritance tax, and they're already screaming from the rooftops. You know, for, for, from the Viscount that owns the Daily Mail right through to Jacob Rees-Mogg, who married a, an heiress. They're all they're all outraged by by uh, inheritance. They make so much noise. But you routinely slice the income of a doctor to the point where they're picking up £15.50 an hour in some cases and lag tens of thousands behind where they would be as an annual salary if things had just continued as normal, even if they'd been indexed linked since the Tories got in in 2010. You, 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 you rely upon the reluctance that these people have to object. It's the same with teachers, really. Any, any job that has an even vaguely vocational element is, well, rich pickings for the worst sort of capitalism, the worst sort of conservatism, the worst sort of rhetoric. Here is someone who really doesn't want to go on strike. I did not become a doctor to down tools and uh, fight political battles with a government full of people who make jokes about rape drugs. That's not what I did. It's not why I became a doctor, but I am doing this because I feel I have no choice. And because we are taken for granted, says the doctor, because we, we, you know, we, we are pushed to the point where we have no choice but to push back. <clears throat> now, to me, that's pretty close to counting. I, 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 it's not counting in the sense of the opposite of an opinion, a thing we say on the program a lot. That's not an opinion, that's counting. But it's pretty close to counting. The numbers are irrefutable. 
Some people who refute the numbers do so from a position of ignorance because they don't care enough about any of the issues to actually find out the facts. That would be the position, the, the dictation from Downing Street is to compare the offer being made to English doctors to the one being accepted by Scottish doctors. There is uh, an ocean of clear blue water between the two offers, but the dictation given by Downing Street to client journalists is that, oh, why aren't the English doctors signing up for this when the Scottish doctors have? They're, they're completely different packages. Anybody from the British Medical Association can explain you to that in words of one syllable if necessary but the but but for the english junior doctors the uh the the, the push to this point is almost unbelievable it's ideological it's political it's probably ignorant uh the idea that any of the uh, austerity cuts brought in in 2010 were necessary is possibly the stupidest contribution to public discourse that this country has seen for 20 years. Even the most cursory understanding of what Alistair Darling and Gordon Brown had undertaken since 2008 would, would, would teach you that. But as I say, if you honestly don't care about anyone or anything, then you can blithely approach these issues from a position of or, or almost violent ignorance almost violent. Look at the noise that's made when inheritance tax and private school fees going up are in the news and compare it to the noise that's made when doctors are asking to have their wages brought back closer to where they would be if they'd received fair pay rises for the last decade and a half. Just think about that for a minute. Who, who's going into bat for parents who can afford private school fees, parents like me, or people rich enough to be eligible for inheritance tax, which is a tiny percentage of the population. Who goes into bat for inheritance tax and private school fee paying parents? And then who goes into bat for doctors? And who do you think's got your interests at heart? Yeah, exactly. So how does it work? I really, really want to understand how it works. One of the most significant moments for me in my life, not, not just in my career, because like a lot of people, my life and my career are intertwined in a lot of places. Increasingly so as the years have passed, I suppose. But I, I, I was almost like a sort of an awakening because it involved someone I knew very well and someone that I, I thought I liked. And it was when I wasn't paying that much attention to politics but I was doing this job for a living. We had a management that was experimenting with the idea of not talking about the news all the time. So, I, you know, I wasn't as, as immersed in current affairs as I have been subsequently. And the firefighters went out on strike. And I hadn't noticed before that even when firefighters go out on strike, the right-wing newspapers encourage their readers to hate the strikers. And I found this genuinely incredible. I know you're... Well, actually, no, I'm not going to apologise for being naive or a bit slow on the uptake because it's one of those boiling frog incidents, isn't it? We're so used to it. It's so normalised. Oh, someone's gone on strike. Here come Rupert Murdoch's uh, lick spittles to attack everybody who's on strike. Here come the Daily Mail's foot soldiers to attack everybody who's gone on strike. You don't stop and think about distinctions between strikers. Firefighters. Such a breakthrough moment for me, politically, to understand the weight that's thrown behind attempts to persuade you to hate the people who run into the building to rescue your children when you're running out of it. That's absolutely extraordinary to me. And it doesn't get any less extraordinary as I get older. You'd think it might dial down slightly or you'd just become a little bit normalised to the egregiousness of it. But stop and think for a moment about what that means. That the, the full weight of the most powerful media voices in the country is thrown behind a cause dedicated to denigrating and attacking the people who have dedicated their lives to you and to me, to looking after us, to rescuing us, to treating us, to curing us, to caring for us. So firefighters was my entry point, my gateway drug, if you like, towards a sort of deprogramming, a de-radicalisation uh, with regard to industrial action. Because I grew up like you did. I grew up with memories of, of the winter of discontent in the back of my mind. Arthur Scargill's um, uh, costive tones ringing out across the airwaves. It used to ring our house. Arthur Scargill, to talk to my dad. My dad was a, a, a correspondent on the Daily Telegraph, covered the um, 
Miners strike a lot, but Dad, this was back in the days when the Daily Telegraph was a proper newspaper. So we'd get calls from Arthur Scargill and he'd get calls from Robert McGregor as well, who was head of the coal board. Both sides would be represented in a decent article written in a decent newspaper. But it's part of the same malaise, actually. The Daily Telegraph's decline into a, into a sewer of, uh, of, of I mean, ignorance and, and, and bigotry mirrors the process by which a country can be persuaded that the people whose job decisions have been made according to public service deserve our denigration, and yet the people who have never, ever spared a thought for anybody else in their whole sorry lives, they're the ones that need looking after and protecting. And I don't understand how it works. I don't understand how it works. I have tried, and I've made some progress, but I, 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 I'm nowhere near completing my homework on this. So why does it work? And I want you either to come at it from your own position. You can tell me why you think, either, and, and, and maybe nothing I've said in the last eight minutes, 10 minutes, has made you question your position. You're still persuaded that the doctors who are striking today deserve a right old kicking, damn those doctors. You still think that. How did you get into that position? I'm not going to patronise you by claiming you've been brainwashed or, 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 or radicalised. Just you tell me your reasons for thinking today that the junior doctors, the striking doctors, deserve your contempt. Or perhaps that's too strong. They do deserve your disapproval. So you can come at it from that angle. Or you can explain to me the journey that you think other people have been on. How anybody can be. This is the psychology of it. Possibly the most important element. You sit here. And you think to yourself, what's an absolute stone-cold open goal? Oh, I'll just, I'll just say nice things about doctors. It's like homeless military veterans, right? Homeless military veterans. We're all on their side, aren't we? Well, of course we're not. Uh, but when we're talking about refugees, we are. Oh, yes, you've got, we've got to look after our own. We've got to look after homeless military veterans. If you had to construct an algorithm if you, that would deliver a section of the population that it would be impossible to turn the public against, who would be in that algorithm? After after the armed services, doctors surely would be near the top of that list. Doctors, nurses, surely, firefighters. Here, here's the algorithm. What do you need? I just want you to tell me, please, Mr. Computer, can you identify for me the portion of the population that it would be impossible to turn everybody else against? Doctors. Doctors. Surely. Doc where, where, I mean, where are you going to go? Your kid's poorly. We've all been there. All parents have been there. And if, you, if you're not a parent, then trust me, your parents were there. Whoever looked after you when you were little, where are you going to go? Yeah, the panic you have when your little one is poorly, even something as relatively innocuous as conjunctivitis can have you uh, tearing your hair out in frustration and fear. Or maybe that was just me. But that's the point, isn't it? This is, this is the, the, the destination for humanity. It's where you go when you need help. Now, that doesn't mean that they can all be given golden carriages. We'll reserve that for hereditary monarchs. They can't all be given tiaras and, and, and golden wands. They can't all be given, you know, uh, plum jobs on, on uh, television stations with no viewers but loads of money to spend. You can't expect them all to be treated lavishly. But if they turn to you and say, we can't carry on like this, how do you get put in a position where you don't believe them? The doctor turns to you and says, you're going to have to uh, take this drug. You're going to have to have this operation. You're going to have to eat less red meat and cut down on... And you're going to have to give up smoking. The doctor gives you advice. Unless you've got mincemeat for brains, you're going to take it, right? You're going to trust a doctor. Not all the time, not every time. I know what white coat syndrome is and all that, but generally speaking, we're going to trust our doctors, okay? And when they tell us that they can't carry on like this, you don't trust them. How does that work? So three ways into it. There is your, your own journey, which you're still on, so you still think that doctors deserve your derision. 03456060973. You have seen the light. You are post-penny drop, and you can explain how you were put in a position which you are no longer in, where you were turned against doctors, actually turned against doctors. 03456060973. And then the third group, which probably will be the biggest, it's certainly the one that I'm in, 
like puzzling over how it actually works. How does it look? I get how I can turn you again. If I did this job from the other side of the coin, you know, if I if I was in the business of persuading you to vote against your own interests and to other various minorities and to make you think that really unimportant things were really important in order to draw attention away from my mates in Downing Street who've been screwing the country for the last thirteen years, I could do it really easy. I get I, I know how foreigner. Uh, baiting works. I know how that. I know how to other people. I could probably get you very worked up about. Um, I don't know gender neutral toilets or something. It's, it's easy to do all that. But how on earth does it work with doctors? How how do doctors end up on the receiving end of epic media abuse? Oh three four five six oh. Well, actually, no. I know how they end up on the end of epic media abuse. It's um, all the things that we talk about almost every day on the programme. It's, it's distracting from the real problems caused by the actual powerful people and trying to turn the public against uh, the innocents, as it were. But how does it work? Why does it work? That's the bit I genuinely don't get, and I still don't get it. I'm 52 next week, would you believe? I know what you're thinking. I think it's down to all the spinach I eat. But I'm 52 next week. And I've covered industrial action now for the best part of 20 years. I had a breakthrough moment during that firefighter strike when I read articles by people I knew attacking firefighters, and I couldn't quite get my head around it. And it comes around again. It comes around like clockwork. Here is a doctor's strike, and here is 80% of the UK media telling the British public to side against the doctors. Why does it work? Not why does it happen, why does it work? 0345 6060 973. We need to understand this. How can it possibly work that one of the most precious and valued professions a society can ever have can be successfully demonized among huge swathes of the British public whenever they have the audacity to tell us that they can't carry on? Like this. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 22 minutes after 10 is the time. And of course, I, I, I'm doing this a lot at the moment. I, I, I also invite um, doctors who are on strike to tell me how difficult that decision was and why you have taken it. And this is still really important. You have to remember, not everybody listens to every minute of every programme with uh, incredible attention. It's really important because the voices pouring poison into the ears of the British public are legion and the voices trying to tell the truth are tiny. So why are you, as a doctor, on strike today and how difficult was that decision to take? The rest of us, we'll, we'll, we'll have a look at why it seems so easy to turn the public against you. Lindsay's in Cheltenham. Lindsay, what do you think? Hi, that, James. Uh, nice to talk to you again, second right, time. Well done. Um, not a doctor, yes, yeah, thank you. Not a doctor, not any way related to the health service. I think well, you it's just are. A, You're it, a patient. Well, I probably will be at some point. Given you my have age, been but at not, some point. Yet, yes, I have been. Yes, yeah, yes, anyway, carry on. Right. It, it's, it, it, is it not just the latest uh, manifestation of the divide and rule and segmentation um, issue? Yes, no, that, but the right that's we... easy to do. So here's some people coming over the English Channel in a small boat, right? They're going ra- yeah. to rape your children and yeah. steal your jobs, right? I get That's easy to do. That's division uh, 101. Here's, here's a doctor. He's going to treat your children and give you a new hip. How it, does that work? I don't, I don't think it matters. I, I think but it must, it must you... matter. The difference is well, clear. If you've, if you've got 90% of a right-wing media um, who are prepared to attack anybody that stands up for their own interests and therefore, by definition, against their interests... But that's not true right-wing. either, is it? Because if people are standing up against inheritance tax or to demand that they still get VAT breaks on their school fees, then the, then the media you describe is, is defending them. It's the tactics. The tactics that you describe are really easy to understand when you can bring in... Uh, scaremongering and fear, but that no one's bringing in scaremongering and fear. So the model doesn't work. It's not the same. But, it, but it's to do with hate, isn't it, as well? It, it's, it's, I don't think... Do it's, people hate doctors? No, of course they don't hate doctors. But if you've got, if you've got bile being spewed out by, by right-wing media saying or, or repeating that Tory MPs are saying that the problems in the NHS, NHS waiting list are 
uh, due to doctors taking industrial action, which is yes. what they have been doing. They have said that. Rishi Sunak himself has said that. It doesn't. Not just the media. Yeah, if you, yeah, and well, I'm, yeah, I'm saying the media are repeating what yeah. Sunak et al are saying. Then, if you continue to do that and you continue continue to pump that rhetoric, slowly, surely, that will seep into the consciousness, and that's that's what's happening, isn't it? Well, maybe. I mean, you make, you make it sound very and simple. The next day it's firefighters. But the but the waiting lists are there even when we're not on strike, even when doctors but, are not on strike. I know, I understand that, but if if if. If you're not told that, if you or if you don't take sufficient interest in the subject, you will swallow the line that's that's put out, which is why they put it out. Oh no, this is this is due to junior doctors striking. That's why we've got waiting lists. And everything that's wrong with the NHS is on the doctors. And the more they strike, the more that fits the 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 the, 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 the model that, of the of that, the. That, the and yeah, does it? And is that, it working briefly, Lindsay? Because my my sense is that they're they're singing all the usual tunes, but not necessarily in the right order. I I, sus, I suspect slowly, probably not. Um, the the general population, um, uh, the, you know, the level of, had enough now. Yes, the the level of patience has worn. So, sorry, no pun intended. That was a very good worn, pun. Thank you. It's worn so thin, or so thinly, that, that it doesn't you, Well, really... you're like me, you're being glass half full, you have to hope so. I tell you what, it, 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 someone will be pulling out the Liam Byrne note next and claiming that the, the, the long tradition of outgoing governments making jokes about how little money is left for the incoming government is somehow pertinent to a conversation about the junior doctor strike in 2024. Well, go, well done me for remembering that. Um, he's, that's what Lindsay's talking about when, when you, you, you refer to these incredibly tired old tra- tracks. It's like sticking on the Bay City rollers or something when there's, a, when there's a strike. Here you go. This is what I was saying about the miners in the 1980s. This is what I was saying about the dockers in the 1970s. This is what Rupert Murdoch was telling me to say about teachers in the 1990s. Oh, I'm just going to say the same about doctors in the 2020s. I, I, I don't know. I, I'd love to think it doesn't work, but I'm not so sure. Louise is in Durham. Louise, what would you like to say? I guess I fall into a third camp. Fourth, fourth. Fourth, fourth camp. Ca- ca- oh, yes, gosh, fourth, fourth camp. Lots of camps <laughs> going on. Um, this is really hard to say. But go on. I think there's just a level of apathy. Um, people go on about the general populace, but I do fall into the general populace. Of course and you do. a lot of us. Do you know what? In the last year, I've faced so many things that are absolutely way more important to my life than whether the doctor's on strike or not. And I think that a lot of people now, especially, and I hate saying since COVID, but especially since COVID, we're struggling to survive. So unless something directly affects us, there's probably just a level of apathy. A lot of us don't bother watching the news. No, no, you're describing apathy. Yeah. Not antipathy. I I think apathy is quite easy to understand. It's the antipathy I struggle with. Well, I just think that um, I, I do listen. I listen to you a lot because... Very wise. I, I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm in an office building. Um, yes. And I would say that I'm one of the oldest. I'm coming up 45. Right. Those people in their 30s and their 20s, they're not, they're not buying newspapers. No. They're not watching terrestrial TV. They're watching Facebook. They're maybe catching news items that come through the social media. Yeah. But when we're talking about the media doing this and this agenda and that yeah. agenda, I don't think the general populace is actually paying much attention to well, traditional I, I, media anyway. No, but I, I oddly, I, I mean, I have to disagree with you slightly because um, that's my whole shtick that's Sorry. gone <laughs> if we're going to stop critiquing the media. But when I uh, dip my toe into what filters down through the channels you've described, it's taking the tabloid model of the last 30 or 40 years and and boiling it down to, to its very essence so that the anti-refugee stuff that popped up on people's Facebook pages as a consequence of, um, uh, of Vote Leave's algorithms and Cambridge Analytica, it, I mean, it's all singing the same tune. It's all pushing people in similar directions. But you're right, it, it isn't necessarily coming from the, from the traditional sources. But what, what, do the, what do the people you work with, what does this... I know, obviously, we're generalising violently, yeah. but but they need the NHS. They must be able to see their mums need the NHS, their granddads need the NHS. Certainly. They mu- 
And I think as a broad sweeping statement, everybody supports the NHS. I mean, you, you were talking a while ago about who the most marginalised person you couldn't turn against. I'm a military veteran. I've been homeless. Yeah. I'm also a carer to a disabled adult. Crikey. I probably am one of those people that you would think would get loads and loads of support. Um, no. But I haven't. No. <laughs> and largely due to being quite well educated and having quite a good no, no work one, ethic. No one really gets any support. No, that's the mad thing. Do. The people complaining <laughs> about other people getting support never give their actual support to anybody. Why no. haven't you got a refugee staying in your spare bedroom? All right. Why, why haven't <laughs> you got a homeless military veteran staying in yours? It's just a I don't know what it is. It's, a, it's another psychological conundrum that uh, allows people to portray themselves as caring by relaying and articulating how little they care about another section of society. Louise, you, you make a great point. And, of course, you've got to bring apathy into it, but the line between apathy and antipathy, is that is that a thin line? Is it easily tipped? Or, or, or are we seeing more and more people not care, which, from the doctor's point of view, is probably just as bad as being persuaded against them. Thomas Watts is here now with your headline. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.34 is the time. Uh, remarkable responses. It happened in real time, didn't it? I love it when that happens. I don't know why. I guess it reminds everyone that we're live. Uh, I, I'm talking to you about the, the so community notes or whatever they're called on Twitter or whatever it's called this week. The way that even the Prime Minister now is being fact-checked by reality, so claiming that they'd got rid of the backlog of, of asylum seekers yesterday, was essentially uh, unveiled as a barefaced lie. And it was an amazingly simple line underneath Rishi Sunak's own tweet about the issue. It just said the backlog has not been cleared. And yet he's back today. He's put out another video of him sitting down with immigration officers. In the next hour, unless you can persuade me otherwise, I am, and this thought only popped into my head during the news, I, I am interested in why Downing Street are betting everything on immigration when, A, they're responsible for what's happened over the last 13 years. This is, if, if this is something you consider to be a crisis, it's a crisis of conservative construction. And B, it's surely an unfixable problem. In private, they recognise the necessity of high immigration, and yet in public, they're dedicating themselves to reducing it. It's, it's a proper political conundrum, that. But I'll take a view at 11 o'clock of whether we've had enough of trying to riddle, uh, riddle right-wing mysteries uh, and should talk about something else or whether you fancy another one after we've continued for, for, for a while to riddle the question of how can we turn the public against doctors? How can that possibly work? I'll say it again, but if you could construct an hour, well, you don't have to anymore, do you? If you, could, if you asked AI, if you asked ChatGPT to identify the section of society, someone's going to do this now, actually. I look forward to seeing the results. The section of society against whom it would be hardest to turn the British public. It would be hardest for the right wing of the political media establishment to turn the British public. Which section of society would it be? Because do it ain't doctors. That's easy, apparently. How come? What are the psychological levers? Mary's in Birmingham. Mary, what would you like to say? Hi, yeah. I think, I think we're looking at it slightly wrong. I oh, think all right. everyone's a producer. Everyone's a critic. Carry on. Um, it's not. I don't think it's about whether it's doctors, because if it's whether it's been doctors, nurses, train drivers, teachers, uni lecturers, you name it. Yes. People, the, the tactic that's been used in the media is to look at the very top, you know, the top wages teachers get. So, oh, teachers are on 40 grand a year and so are uni lecturers and train, train drivers. Train drivers are on a million a pounds a week, I heard. Uh, yeah, exactly. Curb, and, front page of today's Daily Mail, curb the NHS fat cats on £300,000. Yes. And yet, yes. and, and I will give you plenty of time to talk, but I want to get this out while it's still fresh in my mind because I got a message from... Uh, a, 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 a lorry driver, and I'm not going to have lost it. I refuse to have lost it. Pointing out that he's currently he was talking. Here it is. I was talking to a junior doctor on Threads yesterday. James, this is from Jack. He earns approximately seventeen pound an hour. I'm earning twenty one pounds an hour to drive a truck. In what society yeah. should should I be paid more than a doctor? I'm not saying pay me less, but obviously the doctors deserve more. So there's a doctor on seventeen pounds an hour. But the front page of the Daily Mail is talking about yeah. NHS fat cats on three hundred thousand, which is your point in a nutshell. Yeah, and I think the media use that as and the government sort of lap it up as a divide and conquer thing. So if you if you sow that seed of oh well, train drivers on a, a hundred thousand pounds a year and teachers are on 
forty thousand pounds a year. Well, and I'm not. They say. Say and I, and I'm not on that people. sort of. And I'm not on that and, sort of money. So why on earth should I be supportive of them? Yeah. And so rather than us getting behind teachers and doctors and whoever's on strike saying, look, it's not just about the money, it's about the conditions we're working in. Everybody focuses on the money and goes, do you know what, now I've got it tougher. I've got, you know, I've got I've got nursery and I've got children and I've got a mortgage and you're getting £40,000 a year. So no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, no, and, almost, and that, that's it why it doesn't matter. That juvenile in some ways. Well, it is juvenile, and and yeah. you can see that by the way that incredibly juvenile people like Reese Morgan and, and Dorries and the rest of them, and cleverly now, I'm afraid, have have flourished in this environment. But but I still want a yeah. distinction between a university lecturer, for example, or, or or a train driver. That they are not the people who are at the other end of a nine 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 call. So that there has to I mean, is it is it I mean, mm. are we overestimating our, our the, the, the British public and actually it is the same buttons, it's the same levers being pushed and pulled with the same responses, whether it's a doctor or a coal miner. I think it is. I think it is and I think that's horrible because you sort of then you forget the incredible work that doctors and nurses and paramedics and all those people do. And you and it sort doesn't of end matter. up conflating all of the roles in one because they're the same buttons that are pushed every time. World War Two veterans. I think that'd be do you know what? After the after the way that this country's been pushed and prodded and gaslit, I think we'd be the same. I think we'd be going, Well, actually they get they get fancy nursing homes and they get fancy carers. Yeah, challenge, wouldn't it? You know what I mean? And they get all the poppies. So what do they, they get, have to worry get, about? Yeah, or, they, yeah, they get all the money from the poppies. Why are we? Why am I? Why yeah. am I hard on tax? Oh, good lord, that yeah. would be a challenge, wouldn't it? Yeah, and it, it that breaks my heart because I'm. I'm I don't know I'm that you're right. A very, very, very proud veteran who you know he, he's no longer with us, bless him. But oh, he was very proud of his veteran roots and instilled enough love of the military. Could they but push the buttons? The Push the same buttons, pull the yeah. same levers, and this 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 rump of the British population could be turned against World War Two yeah. veterans. I was I, I, I bri- briefly, if I'm allowed to, yeah, my gran was one of the Bevan girls. Gosh, was one of the original NHS nurses. She would be turning in her grave right now. Of course, she would. She'd of be course. turning in her grave. So, to all of you government people who were listening and saying that nothing's wrong, she knew this before she died eight years ago. That something was coming. The direction of traffic was, was, was hard to ignore, although I'm afraid some of us tried because the conclusion was so bleak, you know, and I'm still not entirely convinced that there's a conspiracy in place to reduce the NHS to such low standards that the case for privatisation becomes irresistible, which is the Noam Chomsky explanation for privatisation, for the very simple reason that that credits this lot with a lot more intelligence than they've got. You know, this is this is a government in which James Cleverly can become Home Secretary. It's not a government in which intellectual um, capacity is, is valued, prized or present. Thank you, Mary. Charlie's in Streatham. Charlie, what's going on? Hi, James. Hello, mate. Uh, very good to speak to you. haven't spoken for a while. I was. Um, but I think your question is a brilliant one. It's something I've been thinking about for about four years now. Yeah. And I had a conversation with you four years ago about a theory about why I think it's happening. Go but on. I'd like to replay if that's OK. Yes, of course it is. So I think the dominant political axis in the Western world has changed. It used to be capital versus labour, and I think it is now, and the way I describe capital. it... Capital. I thought you said cattle then. I was getting very confused. <laughs> capital versus labour. So capital so, so wealth right. versus worker, as it were. Exactly, well, which then left versus right. Yes. I think it is now, and the axis is how big is the bubble of people that you care about. On the one side, it's the entire world, and on the other side, it's you, the individual, or possibly your family, or possibly if it gets a little bit darker, the people that look like you yeah. or that you most closely resemble. And I think what has happened is that the more commonly right-wing media has realised this in exactly the same way that people like Nigel Farage did, that Donald Trump did, and they have weaponized that because they realise that most people are having very tough times. I think your second caller on got it perfectly right. There's an apathy bit about what's going on in the wider world because they are so focused on themselves and their struggles that they have, which therefore means that when an individual looks at what's going on, it is very easy from a bit of prodding from the right-wing media to say, 
okay, well, the doctors are going on strike because they want more money, but all of you want more money. All of you are struggling. Why should they get it? And why should they get it? Because you're well, then having... I go, so Jack, Jack is an outlier then. Jack driving a truck and, and absolutely baffled by the simple fact that he's earning three or four pounds an hour more than a doctor is and, and thinks that is wrong. He doesn't want to earn less himself. So he's an outlier. Most, most people... Well, will be presented well, it, with that sort of model and sort of think, yeah, these greedy doctors, why are they asking for more? I Well, it's as I said, it's the political access. That doesn't mean that everybody is thinking no, of around course, the small but enough. bubble side. What it does mean is that the balance point has shifted more towards the small bubble point. And yet, in a way, it hasn't, has it? Because if I'm shifting you towards a small bubble point, I'm actually doing the... I'm in the service of wealth. I'm actually in the service of capital. The, the, the more I can persuade you to hate the p- person over there who doesn't look like you, the less time I'm going to dedicate to trying to improve the distribution of wealth and going after the oh, the unfairness and inequality of it all. Completely. And, and unfortunately, this is where I think the people that are more on the right wing of politics and actually understand it are again using that because they say, oh, well, we can use this to tip people who would normally Mm. not be supportive of wealth and capital to actually say, no, you need to care about yourself. You need to, and actually all these people that are going on strike are making your life harder. So therefore, they're bad and they're not on your side, which in my mind is is exactly why Trump got elected. That was the message he used. It was a very similar message that the Brexit campaign used. It's take back control. It's all the the bubble. The bubble. The bubble eventually only contains you, doesn't it? You know, I'm sort of going to marry your thesis to the famous poem, the famous Martin Niemöller poem, and and eventually there's only you left, really, because you've been persuaded against everybody else. Uh, Nuns. Charlie, I'm at it putting nuns next to the World War II veterans. The section of society, I don't think nuns works, does it? Ian the ice cream, I call him Ian the ice cream. He delivers ice cream to London every day. I sometimes bump into him on Charing Cross Road. He, he thinks nuns, I'm not so sure. I was taught by nuns. I could turn you against nuns in a heartbeat. But World War II veterans, I still think would be tricky, despite Mary's uh, uh, cynical explanation of how you might go about demonizing them. Uh, but chat GPT apparently isn't working uh, on that simple question. Someone has sent me a, a response saying that they're not up, that it's not up to the task. Um, and someone else has said, check your threads and, and, and you'll find it there. So I'll do that while you do this. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 10.48 is the time. So my colleague Roxy asked chat GPT... <clears throat> asked AI to answer this question. Identify the section of society which is the hardest for the right-wing media to turn the general public against. Now, you're going to think we've made this up when we read out the answer because it would feel like a scripted part of this programme. If this programme went anywhere near a script, then this would be proof that it is all planned out in advance. Because the reply that was given by ChatGPT to that question, identify the section of society which is the hardest for the right-wing media to turn the general public against, is as follows. It begins with a hmm. I didn't know that the the AI did that. They're trying to humanize it, I presume. Hmm. Is it a hmm? Hmm. Hmm. So it begins with a hmm. That's an interesting question. It's hard to say for certain, but it seems like right-wing media might have a tough time turning the general public against groups that are widely respected, like healthcare workers or firefighters. Sorry, what, pardon? It seems that the right-wing media might have a tough time turning the general public against groups that are widely respected, like healthcare workers or firefighters. These individuals often have a positive impact on our communities, so it's harder to create negative narratives about them. What do you think? asks ChatGPT. Well, ChatGPT, if you're listening, and as I understand the technology, you always are, you really need to stick your head out the window and then give it a wobble and then wind your neck in. Because firefighters and healthcare workers are precisely the constituencies that we are most baffled by the ease with which they are demonised. So there you go. Even the, 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 the sum total of all human knowledge contained within this amazing new technology is confounded by the question of how do you turn the British public against doctors? 03456060973. How, how did it work for you? 
and actually even on the World War II veterans. Um, this says, I, I'm sure that I read something. What about Ed Miliband's dad? I'm sure I read something about that in a book last year. That's a very oblique reference to how they broke Britain because I do tell the story of how the Daily Mail attacked Ed Miliband's war hero father. Dead by that point calling him the man who hated Britain, even though he'd been involved in the D-Day landings, while the grandfather or the great-grandfather of the current owner of the Daily Mail was, a few years previously, sending love letters to Adolf Hitler. <laughs> Funny, that, isn't it? 10.51 is the time. Back to the successful demonization. I can get it with easy targets. I, you know, turn me against refugees. It's a piece of cake. But doctors, doctors, how can the same tactics work with the people that we... Turn to in our hour of need. Charlie's in Putney. Charlie, what do you think? Hello, James. Uh, Hello. Always nice to speak to you. Hi, well. um, Yeah, I think one of your previous callers was, was bang on when they said about um, it's jealousy. And, I mean, it's no coincidence, is it, that this kind of strike action occurs at times of uh, economic slump, I guess. I know that's a gross understatement, but... Um, and it's those in the public sector, unionised industries that are hit hardest by those slumps. Yes. In in those times, everyone's struggling, right? No one's no one's doing great, or no one that's that's, you know, um, I'm sure no one that's listening to this show is. Uh, well, I is don't doing know fantastic. about that. I, no, um, I, I mean, some people are, aren't they? Some people are going to be going great guns with, with you know, if you've got a nice PPE contract sorted out, or or you've well, got yeah. a, got, a, got a show on one of these weird new television stations where you don't need viewers. But yeah. you do get big checks. So some people are doing, but, um, are doing fine. Uh, Boris Johnson's done all right since he got slung out of Parliament in disgrace. I think Liz Truss has done all right since. But I take your point. That, yeah. They are also unlikely so to be listening to this kind of, This kind of narrative appeals to, to jealousy, and it and it it gets people to to say, well, what what about me? You know, I'm I'm not getting a thirty five percent pay rise, so. You know why do they deserve it? Mm. Um, and it sounds a lot it's, when when it's portrayed in that in that sense. Yeah, it's a kind of uh, it's it's a monetized malaise. Oh, I like um, that. So and, it doesn't matter who it is. If 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 World War Two veterans were getting, no, I mean, I won't say who I work for, although okay. anyone with a modicum of intelligence will be able to work it out. But I work in a unionized industry, right? And um, we've been hailed as heroes in the past right. at various points for various things. Yes. And that goes out the window. Um, and first of all, just train drivers aren't on any way near 100 grand. I just, just want to make that clear. I don't, everybody knows um, that. But I, I agree, you can't make that point um, often enough because someone will be along in 10 minutes to claim it. Yeah, someone on 500 grand will be along in 10 minutes to claim that that's what train drivers are. But, um, absolutely. <laughs> but it's all a version of a distraction technique to divert attention away from the real issue, which in this case is a chronic lack of government funding, which... Funnily enough, simultaneously, that lack of funding is also kind of put on the shoulders of the striking NHS staff as either their responsibility or their fault. And it's it's put as, oh, this is all going to get worse as a result of these strikes. And, you know, how can they go on strike when there's already a lack of staff and all this kind of stuff? But as long as it's preventing people from actually looking at or thinking at, well, why is that? Um, then it will, it will be successful. But I also think separate to that, we I don't know if this is unique to us, but we are such a flippant country. Mm. Um, do you remember what, do you remember David Beckham? I know it's a... It's a of course I remember you know, David Beckham. But no, I mean, what happened with him was... <laughs> He's still um, with us? What do you mean do yeah. I remember David Beckham? <laughs> do you remember what happened to... So he received death threats and they were burning effigies of him in the street. Uh, after he got sent what, off for kicking Diego Simeone. Yeah. Yeah. I don't remember how long after it was. A few years later, he scores a goal in an important match. Now he's a national hero. I, actually, the rehabilitation began a little earlier than that with a world-exclusive interview in the Daily Express written by a little-known young showbiz journalist called James O'Brien. Really? Yeah, really. It was my first, it was my first, just, the, first ever big hit that on, on, on my yeah, newspaper James career. James didn't pay me to call in. <laughs> no, no. That's, it's, it's funny you bring um, it up, but there so, it is. But yeah, I've always, I've always found, because I'm not a football fan in the slightest, I don't follow it, but I've always found It's a good that example of the unbelievable. Madness, like the medieval, you might as well be burning witches, that medieval yeah. scaremonger against a football. A, that's, that's such a negative base uh, human aspect, and I think this kind of stuff just appeals to it and i do think it's a result of the the modern news cycle um in how quickly 
it's it's minute to minute. Well, that's um, but yeah, but it's also as old as the hills. Actually, now you come to think of it, because the the earlier caller talking about the the, the the evolution of the wealth of the of the capital worker paradigm, the, the idea that workers and, and and wealth are in constant tension with each other has shifted into a sort of bubble based idea that that you're only ever really allowed to defend or protect the people that that, that you care most about. I'd, I'd I'd knit the two together actually, and you sort of end up with this. You, you you end up with this idea that you, you can you find a target, and we spend all our time. You actually split the world into people who appeal to our best in- instincts and people who appeal to our worst in- instincts. It's not actually complicated at all. Here's a doctor. All right, here's one person over here. He's quite boring and po faced. You could call him a virtue signaler. He's reminding you what a bang up job doctors do. How important doctors are. And here's someone over here. Uh, he's telling you that doctors are greedy and lying. And uh, it's their fault. Uh, after 13 years, 14 years of defunding the NHS, it's that bloke over there who was who was who was 15 when David Cameron got into power. It's his fault that your nan's hip operation is being cancelled. It's got nothing to do with the people who've been in power for 14 years. And he's appealing to your worst instincts. And the fellow over here is appealing to your best instincts. And the population divides according to their own instincts, but also, of course, according to the size of the platform that those two fellows have got, or the, or the, 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 the size of the voice, the loudness of the voice that those two positions have got. So that platform over there with the person calling doctors liars, greedy, layabouts, he's got 5,000 people shouting from prominent media positions exactly the same argument. The fellow over there who's just reminding you of the bleeding obvious, which is that doctors are generally quite a good thing to have in a society and we should probably cherish and look after them a little bit more than we have done for the last decade and a half. Well, he's, he's, he's all on his own. Only people backing him up are Gary Lineker and Carol Vorderman. And that perhaps is, is a, a, a distillation of some of the bigger pictures that, that today's callers have identified. Thank you, Charlie. Sam's in Nottingham. Sam, what would you like to say? Hi, James. Um, hi. Um, yeah, it was your mention of the firefighter strike that yes. rather caused me and my sort of personal journey in terms of my own attitudes towards strikes. So when, when the firefighter strike happened, I was like a... Yeah, 18, 19 year old student. Um, and I had a nan who lived in, in a home that was, you know, in a high rise sort of block. And, and my kind of, and, and this falls down to, I think, something between the head and the heart. You were talking about the psychology of it. My sort of instinctive, emotional reaction to that was, well, who the hell is going to save my nan? Yeah. Fire? You know, um, who, you know, there was, <laughs> I don't know if you remember, but they were talking about sending in the green goddesses. They always do. Of, they know, always do. I mean, yeah. a previous strike they did actually when I was when I was tiny. I remember that. I remember. Yeah, and I, and I wrote a letter to the local fire service. I said, "Well, how the hell is that going to get up there and save my nan?" You know, yeah. that was a, my really. And, and believe it or not, I uh, I became quite popular in my house because the fire service sent round a fireman to talk to me about the issues affecting the service, which I thought was really brilliant. Um, and that kind of got my brain engaged yeah. in kind of trying to understand more of the systemic issues that were going on. Um, you know, bigger picture stuff. It's not just about my nan. This is about of course. kind of the bigger picture. And then later in life, uh, as I kind of graduated and moved on to work and I worked in the probation service, so you might you might anticipate where this is going. <laughs> um, but the, um, so the, under Chris Grayley, it was obviously kind of... Uh, privatised and, and strikes happened before then, you know, probation staff went on strike to outline their concerns about that. Um, and this is an example, really, of, of kind of it, it going full circle. Yeah. You know, we went on strike when the probation service was, was seen as, as good, you know, and, and kind of outstanding in kind of inspectorate reports and things like that. And then the, the journey of privatisation happened where the majority of services were seen as requiring improvement. So there'd been this denigration of service delivery, you know, which, you know, let's not forget at the heart of this was the public in terms of their safety and victims in terms of the sense of justice. Um, And you you almost felt like, you know, turning around and saying, well, told you so. Yeah. Um, And this is an example of of it going full circle. So, So, you know... Yeah. No, I get it. I get it. I get it. I, I, you've met, you've, we're out of time, but you've, you've made your point perfectly. It does. It, well, it would go full circle. It's about, you know, it's, it's, it's there if you need it. And then they get rid of it. And when you need it, it's not there. And you suddenly realize when it's too late that you probably should have been on the side of the people who were telling you to look after it. 
But as I say, by the time you realise that, it's 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 often too late. And and of course, it takes ten minutes to persuade you that the reason why it's not there anymore, that thing that you need, that f- health service that's free at the point of care, or the or the fire service that doesn't depend upon insurance payments, as is still the case in some states in America and was here, hundred and so hundred and fifty years ago or more. Um, uh, you just blame that on someone else as well. Usually, the 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 layabouts, the the feckless and the work shy, who will always be at the top of the other list, won't they? The list of people who are most easy to demonise. Well, I say the top. They'll probably be just just beneath immigrants and and refugees. It's 11.01. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 11.04. Good morning. Hope you're well. Um, I had a strange conversation with my wife yesterday. And it's, 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 it's haunted me. Well, haunted's a bit strong. But, it, you know, when something just sort of pricks your interest and you sort of think, hmm, we're talking about social media. I have two teenage daughters. I don't talk about them really on the programme since they became of an age where they run a very real risk of having friends or at least parents of friends uh, who have listened to the programme and then uh, they, you know, uh, get picked up. Oh, I heard that you did this or I heard that. So I don't do that. I try not to do that. Um, and we have been thus far very lucky with social media, as in avoiding some of the pat- pratfalls and, uh, and pitfalls that you routinely hear about. It's a particularly horrible story in one newspaper today. I think it was The Guardian. It was The Guardian or The Times about a 14-year-old boy or a, a young man who was 14 when he was blackmailed online by a, by a man masquerading as a teenage girl into sending images and, and things like that that um, really ruined his life to the point of attempted suicide. Um, so that would be at one extreme. And then at the other extreme, you've got the... I, I, I don't know. It's, it's weird if you went to boarding school. <laughs> it's weird in a lot of ways if you went to boarding school. But it's particularly weird because you don't fully appreciate, for, for our generation, for my generation, and, and I, I guess anybody 30 or, or older... That when you got home at the end of the day as a teenager, you could actually close the door. You know, I, I mean, I, I suppose there might have been some graffiti on a motorway gantry on your way home calling you a wombat. But generally speaking, once you got home, you could close the door. And you might worry that your nemesis and his mates were hanging out at the bus stop around the corner, but you just avoid the bus stop. You could close the door when you were growing up and you could almost enjoy the silence i'm not suggesting for a minute that people didn't have incredibly traumatic times and incredibly difficult experiences but you could get home at the end of the day and you could close the door you can't anymore can you 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 have this uh well it's either an addiction or a quasi addiction and this is what we we were touching on and i think that I may have got it wrong. I, 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 so Mrs. O'Brien was worrying about it, just in the, in the broader context of, of teenagers, worrying about social media use and the way that it seems to have captured so many young people in a way that we can't get our head around. And I did that thing that, um, that you've probably heard me do on the radio with, with, with a couple of issues, with quite a few issues. I did that thing where I reminded you that in about 500 years BC, Thucydides was warning against the uh, the perils of modern youth, and I uh, and I did that thing where I said you get you get it with every generation. It was video games for my generation. Video games were this utterly uh, uncharted territory that were going to corrupt us morally and uh, and mentally and and render an entire generation of young people unfit for modern society video games were going to turn us all into arsonists and murderers video games were going to be the end of civilization as we know it the same was true of television in previous generations it was true of radio in previous generations it was true of cinemas it was you know there were even composers whose concerts were boycotted entire audiences would get out get up and walk out of a concert hall because they believed that this modern music was going to prove morally uh corrupting composers i forget which ones i'd sound really clever if i could pick a couple off the top of my head but i've got it's don't look at me like that it's true composers would would be boycotted and uh and they'd have their concerts abandoned and people would walk out in protest at how awful it was so every generation, any Mike and Mechanics fans in the house tonight? Every generation blames the one before. All of their frustrations come knocking at your door. I'm showing my age there. 
But every generation thinks that the, that the generations coming up behind them are caught up in some sort of crisis, some sort of moral and or technological crisis. And I think for the last hundred years or so, it's been, they've been married. It, it has been a moral and technological crisis, snuff movies, video games, rap music. Do you remember when rap music was going to end civilization as we know it? Eminem was going to turn an entire generation of young people into arsonists and murderers. I mean, he, he actually raps about that process in incredibly articulate and persuasive fashion. But it's, it's, and that's what I said to Mrs. O'Brien yesterday. I, I, I said, I don't think there's a particular problem with this because every generation has had a similar experience. They, they face something new that older people have been both ignorant of and terrified by. Chat GPT, probably, would be the most modern, the most box fresh. And actually, some, some people have done a, a, an even better job than Roxy of putting that question into Chat BT um, uh, uh, technology and come up with some answers that I will share with you. In fact, someone did both. I like that. Someone's done the the... the uh, section of society that would be easiest to demonize and the sex sections of society that would be hardest. And um, I I I'll share those with you later if I get the time. Stravinsky, thank you. Stravinsky. Was it the Rites of Spring that caused such uproar? I think it was. I, ne I nearly said Stravinsky, but I was more worried that if I said Stravinsky and got it wrong, I'd have undermined the bogus intelligence I'd displayed by citing composers having their work boycotted by sort of uh, uh, moral crusaders. Heavy metal? Yes, you're right, Paige. Um, there was a satanic panic in the 1980s and the 1990s. Ozzy Osbourne was supposed to be a, de a demon worshipper who bit the heads off live bats. Could be apocryphal, that story, but if it is true, it's because he thought it was a rubber bat that had been thrown onto the stage while Black Sabbath were performing. And anyway, I digress, but it's another great example. Video games, rap music, heavy metal, uh, movies, certain types of... And, and it's always there. There's always a sort of corrupting influence that older generations fear is going to ruin the younger generation. So I did my usual response, and it's sincere, you know. I'm not... I don't, I don't, I don't do it in a in a patronising way anymore. I think I used to be a bit patronising on this subject, on the radio at least, where you'd be just, oh, don't worry your pretty little head about it. Everything will be fine. Young people, the young have always had their problems and they've always come out in the wash. But there's something about the ubiquity of technology now that does feel different. And I know that every member of an older generation who's worried about the challenges being faced by the younger generation has always thought that there was something different about the challenges that they were describing. But this is different, not least because we see it and feel it. You know, when our parents were worrying about video games, they weren't playing Grand Theft Auto. Don't at me if your mum was playing Grand Theft Auto every night. I'm speaking in general terms. When your parents were worried about uh, uh, death metal, corrupting you they were not listening to it themselves for fun so we we are in the technology and without it at the same time we are both within and without if you've been alive as it happened you were in a different space from the people for whom it is just normal it is this is the only reality they know and that's why this story today having had that conversation yesterday did really catch my eye Almost half of teenagers who responded to a study said that they felt addicted to social media. Now, I, I mean, that's a mad word, isn't it? Uh, uh, addicted. It, it's, it's, it's an automatic negative, and indeed, it probably should be an automatic negative. Being addicted to something is bad, but it... <laughs> It, it, it does two things. There's a sort of biological or uh, an, an actual addiction, and then there is a feeling that you are addicted. So 48% of 16 to 18-year-olds either agreed or strongly agreed with the statement, I think I am addicted to social media. And that went up to 57% in girls. It's a, it's a millennium cohort study by University College London, reported by The Guardian today. Um and it's not yet finished, but one of the key researchers uh, leading the, the analysis puts it like this. It's not a nice feeling to feel that you don't have agency over your own behavior. It's striking that so many people 
feel like that. She adds, Georgia Turner adds, self-perceived social media addiction is not the same as drug addiction. And, and that is what I find really interesting. So this is about teenagers who feel that they cannot live without it. I, I don't think you're going to get withdrawal symptoms in the chemical sense that you do with drugs or with alcohol, which is a drug, of course, but uh, we often forget that. It's a sense among uh, half of the teenage population that they, that they think they are addicted to social media. Now, I want to conduct this conversation along two lines. The f and, and I'm going to bring my conversation with, with my wife back into it, actually. And, and I almost want to turn it into, whose side are you on? Should we be worried about this? Or should we give our heads a wobble and remind ourselves that every generation before has also caused parents grave concern about technological moral panics? And, and I, 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 ideally, you draw on experience for that. You draw on experience for that, either your own or your child's. So half of the teenage population of these islands, and it goes up to nearly 60% among girls, consider themselves to be addicted to social media. And that's going to include everything from scrolling through Reddit and looking at YouTube videos, but I think possibly most importantly, the, the social side of it, the Snapchat, the, the, the you know, the WhatsApp groups, the, the social engagement from which you can never shut yourself off. Even if, you're, you know, even if your phone has been confiscated, the conversations are continuing and you've got that fear of missing out. But I genuinely don't know. So yesterday in the car, if you're wondering, I was pretty confident that this was, no, that, that this generation in which both my daughters live, this generation is, hasn't got any problems, particular problems that, that other generations haven't faced. It's just new technology, new names, same stories, same issues. But then I read this article today and I read that line from this researcher. It's not a nice feeling to feel that you don't have agency over your own behaviour. It's not a nice feeling to feel that you don't have agency over your own behavior. And I found myself thinking, yeah, yeah, that, that is perhaps a problem. And it's not like previous moral panics. You know, listening to the Beatles or Elvis, as Alice in Northwich reminds us, that was a moral panic. That was going to corrupt the youth on a scale that had never been known before. But it didn't leave people feeling constantly constantly that they didn't have agency over their own behavior even if you thought you were addicted to grand theft auto you had to come home to play it you know you couldn't be playing it during but i know it's different now with phones but we're talking about generational change so there are two sides to this conversation one of which says just another moral panic the other one says no this is very different and very serious and you know that because of what's happened to you or yours. Okay? So give me a call and tell me which side you're on. Half of teens are addicted to social media. Is this a massive worry for society? Or is it the 21st century equivalent of girls screaming themselves stupid at Elvis Presley? And, and a few boys. 0345 606 Half of teens addicted to social media. What made you realise, either in your own life or in the life of your child, that this is a very different problem from ones that previous generations have had with, with technology and attendant issues? Or from where do you derive your confidence, which I had yesterday but I don't have today, that this is nothing new and nothing to worry about? But hit the numbers now, you will get through. Be quick, 0345 6060 And let me throw in one more. What makes you think that you're addi addicted? Why would you use the word addicted to describe your relationship with social media? 0345 6060 973. James O'Brien on LBC. 
James O'Brien on LBC. It is 21 minutes after 11, and um, it is, it's a question for the ages, isn't it? The idea that the, the, the youngsters today are facing challenges that are unique and corrupting. But I think every generation has felt that about the younger generation. Is so-called or self-diagnosed addiction, and that's the crucial word to social media, in the in the in that category, the category of things that we shouldn't really be worrying about, even though we are. Or does it represent a very different danger, a very different threat from previous moral panics, including everything from Elvis Presley right through to video games? Sarah is in Ilford. Sarah, what would you like to say? Hi. Hello. Yeah. So I was, as I was listening, I was just thinking about like when I was a teenager, mm. and I and I think you know we were just coming up with like the internet was new and everything else, but. Mm. The fact is, when you you take just a short time ago, 10, 15 years ago, we had video games and the new internet and all these other things, but we weren't switched on all of the time. Yeah. Like, we had forced switch-offs, having to go to school or other people's houses or wherever. Well, you didn't have it in your just, pocket. You didn't have the you technology you're, in you're your not pocket. Carry, yeah, you're not carrying around this, this instant dopamine device with you everywhere you go. Mm. And I think, I think it's not... What was telling to me is that it's self-diagnosed addiction. Yeah. It's not like I want. I don't want to say proper addiction, but it's, it's not. It's not addiction in the regular sense because it, it is kind of the same problems that kids always have. You know, not wanting to miss out on stuff their friends are doing. You know, feeling pressure, peer pressure about how they look and how how they behave and all these other things. But the difference between how it was just a short time ago and now is they do have this device in their pocket that connects them to the entire world, any time of the day, all the so, time. So it's a bit like, I mean, if we were to take cocaine as a chemical addiction, mm. if, 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 if it was on tap, yeah. would there be more cocaine addicts than there currently are? Almost certainly. I mean, that's, it's almost, but in that sense, it's in the, in the sense of having cocaine on tap for everybody. You... The way you stop people from using the cocaine all of the time, if it's available to them all of the time, is giving them other things that are enriching to do. Well, and also the discovery that being addicted to cocaine isn't much fun. So, you know, it would become, yeah. it would become self-regulating after a while. But I'm just thinking about numbers. And th that's the point, isn't it? Is that, you know, there were kids addicted to video games and there were, uh, I, I don't know, I presume there were people yeah. who, who were there addicted were, to the Beatles. There are always going to be people who are completely, like, they're yeah. enraptured. It's just it's a, it's a mechanism but, of your brain. Unfortunately, it's going to make you do these things. But this is fifty percent of the teenage but population. I mean, that's that, an epic number. That's what that's what made me really like think and like concerned because it's like I really do fully believe that in terms of any other time, you wouldn't get fifty percent of kids turning around and saying, "I feel like I'm addicted to video games, Elvis, etc." In the same way, you you would be addicted to alcohol or cocaine or whatever. No, but but it, why is that a bad thing? Why is being switched on all the time a bad thing necessarily? I just I think that chill like kids, their brains aren't fully developed, and it's sort of like they don't have that. They don't necessarily have the ability to stop themselves when it comes to that immediate dopamine hit. Mm. It has to be that like. Uh, you know, the rest of us, their parents, teachers, etc., adults, have to step in and, and stop them at a point and, and, yeah, and, and that's give, when it, give them sort of breaks. But that's when, so it, that, that's when it becomes the same as previous moral panics because the adults have no experience of it or, 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 or full, full knowledge of it in the same way that the young people do, so they don't really have the tools that they need to, to wean people I mean, off it. To be honest, I hope, I do hope that there's some, some teens out there who might call in because... Again, this 50% of self-assessed addiction mm, mm. really says that they themselves think it's feel a problem. like it's a problem. Yeah, that's and a really that's good the point. Problem you don't I, use the I'm word having. addiction to describe something good, do you? No. You don't say, I'm if addicted. They were having to, a, when yeah. kids are having a fun time, they're not telling their parents, I feel addicted. They're not telling anyone, I feel addicted. They're saying, this is great. I'm having a great time. I think you're you know, right. the, yeah. the same way we would with our hobbies and interests. Well, hang on. Some people are addicted to this program. That's an entirely healthy <laughs> addiction, I think. Well, um, there are exceptions. There are, exceptions. there are always exceptions to every rule. That's true. That's true. <laughs> no, that's beautifully put. And you use the word dopamine a lot. And um, book recommendations already coming in, including one called Dopamine, Dopamine Nation by uh, Anna Lemke, 
which Stephen describes very well here. He says, it talks of the current access to high reward, high dopamine stimuli that we have in today's society. So it could be drugs, but it could also be news, instant shopping, gaming. All these things give us a quick hit of dopamine that then we are constantly chasing. Phone ringtones, message pings, red dots on apps, Instagram likes, digital devices constantly making us feel good. But then we lose the balance between pleasure and pain. And another book that Emma recommends from London by Johan Hari um, uh, called Stolen Focus. And that book, she says, changes the way you think about social media and the social consequences of the abbreviated world we live in, from Twitter to Insta to Snapchat. He points to a lack of compassion, shortened attention spans, and eventually wonders how that might affect the democracy that we live in and what we expect from our leaders. It's powerful stuff. But would we have had messages like that 20 years ago when we were talking about the rise of the internet, for example? So, uh, Tamina is in Newham. Tamina, what would you like to say? Hi. Hello. Um, I hope you're okay. I actually <laughs> echo just your past call and exactly what you just said. I also used the word uh, dopamine hit and instant, instant gratification. Yeah. I definitely do believe that the society we live in now, um, you know, even culturally, obviously I, I, I'm a Bangladeshi, but... Even culturally, every generation, you know, even amongst our own culture, wh whatever it is, you know, the older generation, they fear the new of how it will affect their children or things yes, like that. Exactly. Whatever it may be. Um, but I do believe, you know, as a society now, you know, in the past, I've read about how you mentioned even, you know, musicians or, you know, magic shows or, you know, all these new things that suddenly would come about. People would be alarmed. Batman and Robin. Someone's just sent me uh, an archive <laughs> of Batman and Robin. We're going to turn everyone gay. Did you know that, Tamina? <laughs> oh, well, you know, who, who knows what would affect each individual because everybody is different. Mm. But I do believe now, you know, I, I gave the example of how... Social media itself has changed from when, you know, when I was a teenager. Um, I have recently only just got Instagram last few years, not from the beginning. But if you just just focusing on that, it was just pictures. Yeah. But now we have these, I think on Instagram it's called Reels. But why so are these like, a bad thing? Why are these so, so Stuart's just texted to say, so kids are addicted to talking to each other. What's wrong with that? See, it's not that the talking is bad, because if anything, now, you know, we aren't talking to people enough and we've, you know, become isolated in our own world. But when it takes over your life, because it's this social addiction, and there, there is, because you get this instant gratification, like things like a real, you know, your attention span, because even as adults and, you know, we're constantly looking to the next thing, it's, you know, we're used to these short, short videos. Yes. You used to be longer videos and now even they've implemented a YouTube short and you see young children who are constantly that they they're not satisfied oh this is too long or let's move on to the next thing and it's like kind of trigger happy onto the next thing next thing next yeah, thing but I, I, I did, again I don't I, I hear that and I heard that about the internet shortening everyone's attention spans and then long reads came back in again and people discovered the pleasure of I'm seeing, I'm hearing you describe a pendulum that's swinging. I'm not hearing you describe a permanent that, change. For us, for us. For yeah, the, for us. Uh, for younger children, though, who, like, like your previous caller, as I mentioned, their brains are not yet developed. So if we're giving, we are older, we are used to, we're exposed to a lot more things. Younger children who are exposed to these fast-paced, you know, quick, quick, quick things. It does affect everything. It will affect them in their education. It will affect them in, you know, having conversations. They'll get bored easily. Mm. And, you know, I know that uh, a book you mentioned that in the end, democracy, or things, it does in the end affect, if you just look at the society now, children are having a lot more, you know, ADHD was on the rise. Um, even just programs, like my sister once described how a 10 minute, you know, you YouTube cartoon for children now. In 10 minutes, you've got a beginning, middle and end. Um, a quick story. It's got lots of adventure, lots of colours, lots yeah. of everything. So it makes it difficult for children to sit down and watch a longer movie, for well, example. Matt, well, but cartoons were always 10 minutes long. I mean, when we were watching them on Saturday mornings, there's definitely something in, you, in what you say. I don't, want to, I don't want to sound dismissive. I think I'm sounding defensive. I, I don't want to believe that there is a, a sort of much graver threat out there than... I've previously acknowledged because I don't like threats. But I think the consensus is much closer to, 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 to Mina than it is to me. James, this is very different from previous generations, says Sadie in Nottingham using capital letters. As a teacher, I've worked with zombified students who are up until 3 a.m. 
gaming. As a parent, I've dealt with children who feel so empty when they haven't got their phone that it triggers outbursts that last for hours. Teenagers who come home complaining of boys hassling them on themes relating to explicit pornography. And as an onlooker, I've seen parents in parks checked out of their own children's lives as they remain glued to the phones while their children try to get their attention. We have a big problem. But I could pick through that, I think, Sadie, and give you previous examples from previous generations of almost identical fears and complaints. So I, I, I don't know that we've nailed yet, apart from the constant access, the real reason why we should be more worried about this than any previous marriages of new technology with young generations. It's 11.32, my apologies. Thomas Watts is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. It's 11.35, you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Almost half of teenagers who responded to a study said that they feel addicted to social media. And I suppose, in a sense, we're just wondering how worried we should be about that, with me playing the role, or not playing the role, with me in the role of, um, oh, crikey, I hope it's not as serious as it sounds. And I do hope it's not as serious as it sounds, but I'm on a sticky wicket at 11.36 at the time. Also, if you've got examples of things we've missed... When it comes to previous moral panics, that's that's quite fun. I, the, the stuff about Robin and Batman and Robin posing a threat to the heterosexuality of of, of, of the generations uh, that first experienced—I presume it was the Burt Ward incarnation of Batman and Robin, was it? Rather than the comic strips, I'm not sure. But other moral panics that were supposed to be proof that we were raising a generation that would be de- detached from, unhitched from the, the, the moral regulation that their parents and grandparents had enjoyed. I don't know how you say that in a country where Boris Johnson can become prime minister. I'm worried about the moral corruption of the young people. Really? OK. Uh, Tessa's in Ashford. Tessa, what would you like to say? Hi. Um, hello. I'm a, hello. I'm a deputy head teacher and a SENCO and also a mental health leader at a primary school. OK. Um, and I think what we're seeing more and more and, and the discussions at school amongst senior leaders are saying is this the impact of um, children's addiction and use of uh, screens so obviously I'm in a primary school so it's not so much social media okay. although they are using they're using Snapchat, they're using WhatsApp um, but what we're seeing is children's behaviour is being seriously impacted and we think it, it got worse over COVID. Yeah. So uh, where we were all using screens and we were encouraging, obviously teaching and things were online, encouraging. But now children, parents are telling us that the children go home from school. So this is primary children. And they're literally on a screen or a device from the minute they leave school until, um, until bedtime. And that bedtime gets pushed further and further uh, back yeah. because they can't come <clears throat> off it. And, and but that, that's a problem as old as the hills, the bedtime issue. And I'm, I'm, yes. this is a rhetoric. This is a devil's advocate question. But what's wrong with being on a screen all the time? Well, what we're seeing is that when that screen is removed, there's um, huge meltdowns. Parents tell us they can't get yeah. their children off the screens because of the meltdowns. And when children are in school, their ability to use their executive functioning is so diminished. I mean, it's. It's a serious problem in our classrooms at the moment. The um, children's lack of um, attention, inability to organise their thoughts, organise themselves when their screens are removed. So that is the real difficulty that we're seeing in classrooms is the impact on uh, children's, as I said, executive functioning, concentration. Um, so yeah, number, so, and, you, and so, so you, you see an inevitable link then between... The, what, what is it? The instant gratification nature yeah, of, of being on the exactly screen. And then now you've got to sit down for exactly half an hour that. and do your geography homework and you just can't. I can't do that. Well, it, it's not even the homework. What it's is it? Actually in class. Just the in, lessons. So when the children are in class, in lessons, um, their concentration is is so diminished. And as you say, it's not as exciting as looking at a screen. It's mm. not as exciting as playing Fortnite, um, as being on WhatsApp. It's not that instant gratification. So, And you're talking um, primary school, so they might not be self-aware enough yet to answer this question. But if half of teenagers are saying that they feel addicted, they think they are addicted, they're recognising yeah. the negatives, yeah. aren't they? A- absolutely. My daughter's 11, so she's just gone to secondary school. Um, and I see it in her as well. I mean, I'm so aware of it, so I do limit her screen time. Mm. But that's a battle, even with me knowing about it. 
me trying to put those restrictions in place. Everybody's got Snapchat. Everybody's um, got Instagram and all those other things that she wants to have. Um, and at the minute, I the condition that she can have that for a little while is that I read it and I see it. Yeah, but and that's not going to last forever, is it? No, absolutely. But in also in primary school, the children do have Snapchat. And then we, uh, and again, the bullying online is intense. Even in primary school, yeah. we get parents coming in showing us um, screen um, uh, screenshots of the things that children have said to each other. And because they're so young, yeah. they're not old enough to be using it. And right. so the things they're saying are a bit unkind, but then it gets escalated sure. and the parents get involved. And again, that is, but they need to have that feedback, that gratification of, do you like me? Are oh, you my friend? Constantly. So you get a dopamine yeah. hit from, from, a, from an act of friendship. But, but for, yeah. our, for, for my generation, I think I'm older than you, it would be very, very rare, wouldn't they? You know, you'd score a goal uh, uh, and, and everyone would pat you on the back or something like yeah. that. Whereas here you're getting it every, 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 every few seconds and you, you yeah. grow to need it. And when it's not there, you, uh, you, exactly. you start jonesing. You start, you know, you start craving it. Absolutely. And, and going out and doing other things. As you say, I mean, so lots of the kids, they're still, you know, they'll go and play football, they'll go and do sport. Mm. But other than that, it's so, it's so much more limited. Children just, you know, going out, going for a walk, spending time with parents. And again, screens. A and the temptation for the parent is, is, is to, 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 to treat it like a kind of babysitter, isn't it? To sort uh, exactly. of, just because now yeah. I can get yeah. on with cooking dinner or I can get on yeah. with watching my own programmes or I can get yeah. on with checking my own social media. I don't need to worry about... My exactly. child, well, it almost, it's, it's almost killed boredom then. Yes, and that's the problem. Because that's actually, the title, isn't it? The death of boredom. Be, yes. Because it's good to be bored sometimes. Of course it's good to be bored because then you teach yourself how to get out of it as well. Exactly, yeah. The death of boredom. Yes. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Tessa. And in fact, as you were speaking, Duncan, who is also a teacher, more than 30 years, um, reiterated one of the points you make, that the the bullying, they are unable to have any respite from bullying as it follows them everywhere. Phone, tablet, even the watch on their wrist. That is the difference, James with previous generations. I teach primary age pupils and now have to deal with the impact of bullying following children everywhere in the online space. And I think it is a real concern. Um, And this from Jim. I remember my mate's religious mum being in a panic over us playing Warhammer, the role-playing games. She was convinced we were going to become Satanists. And that's from Jim, who uh, describes himself as a Satan. No, he doesn't. That's a joke. Uh, Dungeons and Dragons as well, for, for, for when, when I was a kid. I think there was some genuine moral panic about Dungeons and Dragons. But the more this conversation goes on, the less that seems relevant. I don't know whether you're listening to this and listening to people like Tessa and previous callers and hearing what I thought yesterday, which is, no, this is just a little bit different. The tune's the same. It's just the words that have changed. And you're clinging to that. You're sustaining that belief that this isn't any really different from previous marriages of of moral panic and new technology uh, because I'm struggling. I'm not really. It does sound profoundly different for a number of reasons. That's perhaps the bit I wasn't expecting. That phrase there, the death of boredom, uh, that, that sounds really significant. The bullying stuff you could have worked out in advance and you can make a case, especially if you went for, to boarding school where you never got to escape from bullying particularly. So you can make a case for this, saying it's not that new. But the death of boredom for this generation, the inability to deal with nothingness, there's always something there to stimulate them. That's actually quite remarkable when you think about it. I don't know what you were like during lockdown. I thought I was going to read millions of books. I thought I was going to read all the books I'd never got around to reading, of which there are several. Um, Obviously, I had to write a book, which was a bit of a stress during lockdown. But the... um, the reality was I lost my ability to read books. I lost my ability to get beyond three or four pages. I don't know why. I, 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 I don't know if anyone's looked into why because it was a widespread problem. We've talked about it before. But it has something to do with that, that death of boredom, some, some sort of link. You'd be on your phone all the time. You wouldn't be sitting down and you know, doing books. I suppose it's a bit like living on junk food and never, ever, ever having a salad in a way, the levels of nourishment. Um, So right now, this seems to be a much bigger issue than even perhaps some of us expected. Uh, There is, however, room for for, for the other point to be made. So no, seriously, here's my 
proof that this isn't actually that new or that scary or that different. It, here's, a, here's an attempt at it. There is no evidence that screen time affects children's education or their ability to learn. They have done studies and they showed no direct effect. Number one, I'm not so sure that's true. But number two, it, 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 you've heard it yourself. You've seen it yourself. You know, a child that can't surrender their phone. If half of teenagers are saying they feel addicted to something... Um, I don't think all the studies in the world are going to be able to draw a conclusion that that's not problematic. It's 11.45. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 11.48 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I was put on a school watch list for taking out the catcher in the rye because of the links to John Lennon's assassination. Well, before the... Uh, uh, a chap who killed John Lennon was ca found to be carrying a copy of J.D. Salinger's classic book. It was already causing moral panics. And book burning in American high schools. I watched Footloose with one of my girls over Christmas, the original version. That's a cracking film, it really is. But the idea that books or rock and roll music could corrupt the younger generation is, is you know, it's part of our shared history. And, and Catching the Rye, often on... Uh, on the lists of books that, that right-wingers or, or evangelical Christians want to ban. That's the definition of a moral panic. I'm, I'm seeing the social media story through rather different lenses now, not least because of that that thing that's really going to stick with me, that phrase that we came up with together, that the death of boredom, a, a generation that has never learnt to be bored. That's kind of weird, because the last thing you wanted to be when you were a kid was bored. I'm bored. School holidays, punctuated, constant. I'm bored. Are we nearly there? Are we there yet? Are we nearly there? I'm bored. The kids don't even get bored in the back of cars anymore, do they? Because they've got a screen in their hand. It's the worst thing you could be as a kid was bored, and yet possibly it was among the most important lessons that you learned. I don't know. Mary's in Glasgow. Mary, what would you like to say? Hi, James. How are you? Very well. I'm bored. I'm not, obviously. I'm sorry. No, I just, uh, <laughs> carry on. <laughs> James, I'm sorry, but I'm back onto the, the education topic again. Yeah, I'm a secondary school supply teacher, right? Mm. Um, the death of boredom. I'd hate to think that the, the kids were sneaking looks at their phone because they were bored out of their minds. I tried to make it as as unboring as possible. Yeah, I have two, two issues here, teenagers, right? Uh, the phone's in class. They check them all the time. It's affecting their learning. Uh, and the second part to that is that when I have to deal with the phone situation in class, it's disrupting the whole focus of the lesson that I'm trying to give them. The second main point is that I'll, I would love it. I know it won't happen, but I'd love it if parents said to their teenagers, Look, leave your phone in the kitchen when you go to bed, because I don't think parents realise that their, their kids are on the phone till 2 or 3, 3 o'clock in the morning. They come into class the next day and they're absolutely exhausted. And this is the commonplace. This isn't the exception. This is the rule, really. This is, this is commonplace, but I'm not saying that all pupils in classes are on their phones. They're not. We have, well, I think teenage pupils are brilliant. I love my job. But I do think that this constant checking of their phones and having to have their phone there, where they're checking WhatsApp or checking messages. What are they home. checking for? I mean, I don't know. I'm sounding like such an idiot because I, I do it myself. I, I, in <laughs> fact, in our house, it's the other way around. My kids tell me off for being on Twitter too much. So you're just checking because you've got that weird itch, haven't you, that you might have missed something. Well, listen, I'm the, I'm the same. I live in Moan. I'm an older person. Mm. I'm not old, by the way, but I'm an older person. Mm. And the phone is a light thing, and I do check it. And I, and, and I know I'm a bit addicted to it, right? It's a bit crazy. Can you watch a so film without to... checking it at home? Uh, no. No, there it is, you see. So... Well, the, phone, the, the, phone's all, the phone's always near me, and I check it. But I think my circumstances are different. I'm on my own and stuff like that. No, I know, but, but you would have watched class. a film. We wouldn't. I mean, checking it when you're watching a film is a bit unnecessary, isn't it? But we can't help ourselves. We can't help ourselves. Mm. But the thing about the teenagers is um, when they're checking their phones, then I see they're not really engaging in the lesson. I have just spent time um, instructing them in what they're, what, they're, what they're going to be doing, you know. So then I've got to say, excuse me, because at the beginning of a lesson, I'll say the first thing I say to them, apart from, hello, I hope you're doing okay today, is, yes. right, guys, chewing gum in the bin. I know that'll sound a bit odd, but that's one of the things that really gets on my goat. Chewing gum in the bin. Doesn't sound odd at all to me. I, I would not want anyone chewing gum if they were working, like looking, just looking at me at doing this now. Well, well, it's more you of get that. distracted yeah, when they eat you, bananas. It's, well, 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 it's a school rule. Don't have the chewing gum in your mouth, and I've got to. You know, school rule: jackets yeah. off, chewing gum out, and I don't want to see any phones out. And I can mention the phones that's like three times, and I'll still see somebody. The girls are very good at sneaking the phones under their thighs. Gosh. The boys. 
yeah. put, put it between their thighs and they, they think that, you know, you're They're standing at the front of the class and you don't see these things. But of course you see them. So I've got to disrupt the lesson and got and say, excuse me, put the phone away. I did ask, them, ask you nicely at the beginning. The phones go away. But even that disrupted because everybody listens. So then I'm disrupting the work because then that takes attention because other people's asked me, hear me asking somebody to put their phone away. So it disrupts the whole flow. But this thing about people's on their phones in their beds till two or three in the morning, some of them, some of them are absolutely exhausted in school. Um, and yeah, do they look bored? And that, yeah, and, that, and, that, and, that and that's exhausted. more than the, the you, so you know a class with thirty kids in it, and and there would always be one or two like this and one or two like that. But you're describing a tide, a tidal wave, if you like, a trend. You're not describing exceptions, and and it, they're all. I mean, it's like a. It's a polygon, this, isn't it? It's, it's, it's got so many different sides to it, all of which contribute to the sense of, of, of quite a big problem. Um, I can't claim the credit for the death of boredom. It, 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 there's an article on Medium uh, from March of 2019 that, uh, that, that coins the phrase. Thank you to uh, Grant who sent me that. Someone, someone's obviously just Googled. You've got, well done. When was the last time you heard somebody say they were bored? The last recollection I have of someone telling me they were bored was via an MSN message. Uh, which would be in the in the in the sort of two thousands, uh, and it, and it's a really interesting article. I'll read it later. Television works the same as it t- did twenty years ago, except except you can choose the quantity and quality everywhere you turn. When was the last time you were bored? Because if you were bored, it was for a nanosecond. Do you remember that line in Why Don't You? Why don't you switch your television off and go and do something less boring instead? But when was the last time you were bored? Because you can't be bored. Unless, unless you're on a plane and your batteries have run out, right? You can't be bored. Even if you think I'm boring, you can turn me off and put something else on. Put some Mantovani on, perhaps. You can't. It's not just kids. None of us are ever bored anymore. Um, and, and speaking of the death of boredom, Mark in Harrow, you can, I've got some great news. You can use Global's rewind function. He says, morning, James. The death of boredom is indeed a great phrase, but did quotes, we really come up with it together? I got the impression that your caller coined it. Actually, no, it was me that coined it. But because I was in the process of talking to someone that the phrase popped into my head, I thought it was much more generous and fair to use the word we rather than I. Um, But somehow you managed to hear the opposite, as you will discover when you use Global Player to rewind live radio, because you're always in control. Uh, Nicola is in Camberley. Nicola, what made you pick up the phone? Oh, hi. Um, I think Tessa, a couple of calls back, she kind of echoed quite a lot of my experiences with my daughter this morning. I literally had to wrestle her into school. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, She's, yeah, well, it's a daily thing, but um, she's only eight and she is awaiting an ADHD and autism assessment. Um, But she's super bright. Mm. She's super bright. Um, But she just can't tolerate being expected to sit behind a desk and watch this teacher all day and it's just excruciating for them um and we you know we do limit screen time at home but she just finds normal life so boring compared to you know watching that stuff that they watch but what would um, what would think, what would she have been like 20 years ago though without the option well, of screens I, would well, she have learned? Probably be a lot better. She probably would have been a fidgety kid, but she yeah. would have been climbing trees after school for oh, three hours, right, yeah. and she would have probably been absolutely fine. Um, I used to actually make children's television, and um, the anything the we'd I know, Nicola. The, Not you didn't make. Why don't you? Did you? You're far too young. Uh, no, uh, no, I did make some how and some how brainiac oh, stuff. Fantastic. Yeah, do you remember how? Yeah, yeah. I do remember yeah. how. My friend commissioned yeah. brainiacs actually. Oh, there you go. There was some great stuff on then. And actually, children's television is still good. Yes. But it's the stuff that they put on these YouTube channels. And the cut rate is so fast now, it's manic. And it's great. That means scene to scene, does it? The scene to scene is the cut rate. Yes. Ding, 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 ding. Yeah. Yeah, the edits, the edits, the cuts. Um, It is so manic. Um, it's grooming their brains to need this kind of hyper reality. This boom, 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 boom. So it's like living on sugar. Norm- it's, like, it's like living on speed. Yeah. yeah okay. For them. And they love it because it gives them the <laughs> dopamine, especially these kids who have the ADHD oh, who are lacking the dopamine. That's so that, that's really. That I'm sorry for what you're going through. I hope you get some sort of resolution soon. But that's yeah, an well, incredibly. We're, we're at the point where we're thinking something very radical and just all together switching off the Wi-Fi. Yeah. Entirely when they're in the home because it's something. Because it's making everything worse. 
Yeah, but then you're in the situation where your poor child can't relate to anything the other kids are talking about and because least, they're, you yeah. know, they're isolated in that respect. So it's re- oh, you know it's difficult to get the balance. It is difficult. Well, it's impossible. But, to but, but really... you know, I really believe that later we will realise that this whole generation, their brains have morphed into something very different. So it's not just the content of this stuff. It's it's the cut rates. It's the speed of the actual programmes that yeah. are coming out. Well, I mean, this has been a, an amazing conversation the whole hour, but you've taken us into another place, another side to the to the polygon. Mm. When When's the last time you were bored? Oh, I try not to use my screen too much because I see it happening. But when's the last so, time you um, were bored? Yeah, probably not that long ago. Pro- oh. Probably when my phone died in an airport recently. <laughs> That's what I said, yes, was... <laughs> exactly. That's insane. <laughs> you know, and you're left with people watching. Yes. Which actually was quite nice. You're going to talk to, <laughs> have to talk to your family if it carries on. Yes, <laughs> it's exactly. It's yeah. a crazy one. That was, that, that was part of the point, actually, of talking about previous generations and thinking, because a lot of what we've discussed is going to apply to adults at least as much as it does to children. But for children, they've never known any different, which seems to add a whole new dimension of worry. Nicola, thank you. That was a, gosh, we'll do that again. Wasn't that interesting? And that idea of, of, of the, I've never, can we do an hour on when, when's the last time you were bored? Would that work, do you think? I'm in the mood for, I, I, I mean, I can't remember the last time I was, we're we just going to take 30 calls from people whose phone ran out of batteries while they were on an aeroplane. When is the last time, how mad is that question? When is the last time you were bored? I spent my entire childhood being bored. Uh, not only were there only three television stations, but I grew up in Kidderminster, which has a carpet museum. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. Three minutes after 12 is the time you're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. I, I, um, I am well aware of the escalating situation in the Middle East and, and of the fact that we haven't really addressed it since we got back from the Christmas break. And... And I do think that the the tactics of the Israeli government have now veered pretty conclusively into the territory of the indefensible. Um, But, of course, the difficulty of speaking to people who are actually in Gaza, exacerbated daily by the Israeli government's refusal to let journalists do journalism, um, uh, uh, prevails. So we're hoping to make contact with a, um, a, a scientist who's in uh, Khan Yunus at, at the moment with his mother and sister. He, he was there when the offensive started and elected to stay a British Palestinian dual national. We'd, we're hoping to make contact with him at about quarter to one today to find out what the situation is like on the ground. Um, so I think before that, we will actually do boredom. James O'Brien doing boredom on the radio. Huh, plus a change. Uh, thank you to everyone who's been in touch to say the last time you were bored. Well, a Tom actually leads the line of people saying the last time I was bored was when you were on holiday. But obviously that's a joke. Um, last time I was bored was when LBC went down. There you go. It's all coming in now. But this one is the most interesting text. That's absolutely crazy now you've said it, James. I literally can't remember the last time I was bored. There's a story in the newspaper today. I don't know if you saw it. It's from 20. 20- 17, uh, Andrew Scott, the, the, the star of Sherlock and loads of other um, shows, has a, a, a flea bag, actually. It's probably the, the real breakthrough show for him, wasn't it? He, he uh, given an interview to a podcast. Must get him on mine, actually, in which he revealed that he was doing Hamlet once at the Almeida Theatre about six, seven years ago. And he noticed someone in the audience had taken out their laptop to apparently check their emails. And, I mean, that's extraordinary, isn't it? And yet it's probably proof of the pudding that we're currently eating or the pudding that we're about to eat, that he was actually... So I think, if I were honest, the last time I was bored would be in the theatre or the cinema. It would be briefly bored. Because if you're watching it on television, you'll get your phone out. If you're in the theatre, you can't, really, unless you're a pleb. I know this bloke got his laptop out, but that's an exceptional response to being a bit bored in the theatre. It's also incredibly insulting, not least because um, he was about to give the to be or not to be soliloquy, which is arguably the the, the finest point in the entire play, uh, certainly in verbal terms. So the, 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 yeah, I think you can be sitting in an audience, particularly in a long play, and your interest can lull, can't it? You can get a bit. So that would probably be the last time I was bored. The middle, the sort of, 20 minutes, the first 20 minutes of the last half an hour of Saltburn 
I was quite bored. I don't know if you've seen Saltburn. It's an extraordinary piece of cinema, but not necessarily a very good film. And and it all goes a bit bonkers. You get towards the last half an hour, and it's as if the scriptwriter had an essay crisis and just glanced at the clock and thought, oh, my crikey, I've got to finish this film by 12 o'clock, and it's now 10 to 12. A bit like the Liz Trust chapter in How They Broke Britain. The um, The... the the, the the idea that you could uh, yeah so I that but I don't know if that's proper boredom. You think of childhood boredom. You would wake up in the morning and you'd wonder what the hell you were going to do all day, all day. So there's so many different flavors of boredom. James in Glasgow's mum always used to say that only boring people get bored. Well, no offense to your mum, James, but I bet she got bored occasionally, and I bet you got bored of hearing her say that only boring people get bored. Don't be so boring, Mum, you might say. You're constantly telling me that only boring people get bored. It's one of the most boring things I've ever heard. Um, Boredom begets creativity. We're going to look at that in a minute. I get bored whenever I hear about the darts, but you don't, do you? You just find darts boring, so you don't have to watch it. And then the occasional two-minute hit, because Luke Littler is rewriting the rule book and indeed the record book at the uh, at the darts this at the Ali Pali this week. Um, that's not boring, not in the sense that you've got three hours ahead of you and you're stuck in a car and you're already tearing your own hair out with frustration. And your dad told you to be quiet until we get to uh, Nottingham. Boredom, boredom. It's remarkable. I met Gordon. I didn't tell you, did I? I met the the, the, the broadcasting legend Gordon Astley came to see my show in Manchester before Christmas. Uh, uh, Gordon, of course, responsible for what is by far the finest radio jingle in the history of radio. Gordon, Gordon, drives away your boredom. If you wake up feeling ghastly, tune in to Gordon Astley. I, I've been listening. I was listening to him on the radio when I was eight or nine years old, and that's when I knew what it was like to be bored. Not listening to him. He was an elite. He, he delivered. He did exactly what it said on the tin. He drove away your boredom. But when you're eight or nine years old, there's a level of boredom. Before you got a spectrum, before you got a pager, back in the days when I wasn't just uh, tribal quest, anybody? No? Okay. Tribe called quest. Um, two questions then. When's the last time you were bored? But don't really get stuck into that one. Because I've got a more clever question for you. What would you never have done? if you hadn't been bored. So think back now, over your whole life, and the thing that you have done, if you go fishing, do you take your phone with you? Because being bored is good. What would you never have done if it wasn't for boredom? What what did you do in non-technology, so it can't involve a screen, that's why it's linked to the last hour, you... You took, you do something. So you might not eat. If you hadn't been bored as a child, I think the holy grail for this hour, if you hadn't been bored as a child, you wouldn't have the job you've got now. Bored, I want to know where boredom took you. And I think we're going to concentrate for that bit of the phone in. We're going to concentrate on childhood boredom. Because that realisation halfway through the last hour that children don't know how to be bored anymore led pretty quickly to the realisation that none of us can remember the last time we were bored either. When's the last time you were bored? So that's that's one question, but I want to focus in on the other one first. Where did childhood boredom take you? So look back. I suppose it can involve a screen if you became a coder or something like that, if you became someone who wrote programmes. But where did it take you? If, if it wasn't for the fact that you were bored as a child, you never would have. And it's not just boredom, is it? I, a text came in a moment ago, Alan Somerset. It's the birth of the pursuit of constant gratification. So it's two things. Because you could say, I mean, I, I got bored as a kid, but then again, I could I could spend four hours on my bicycle cycling for as far as I could go, getting there, eating my sandwiches, and then cycling back again. And I loved it. It was amazing. I, I, I won the premium bonds when I was about 11, and I bought a drop-handled racing bike from Woolworths. And my goodness me, I was the king of the road. And, and, and the imagination games you would play. But, you know, whether you were doing an adventure game, you could do that on your own sometimes. You could, especially if you're lucky enough to grow up in the countryside, pretend you were an explorer. You, the games you could play in your head, in your own head. Now, you wouldn't do it now because you can have it in front of you in glorious Technicolor. It doesn't matter that your imagination could conjure up more. It's remarkable that the, um, the ability, the capacity, the experience of being bored feels so, 
so rare. I mean, listen, I'm not going to apologise to you if you arrived at this conclusion years ago. You've been aware of the death of boredom for for ages. I think for most people today is um, is boredom. Incredible. So, what um, what would you never have done if you hadn't been bored as a child? Okay, o three four five six o six o nine seven three is the number that you need. The second question is, when was the last time you were bored? Like hand on heart, o three four five six o six o nine seven three. The last, genuinely, the last time you were bored, because I think, like me, you're probably re- reeling from the realization that you just get your phone out and you're not really bored in the sense that you were before you had that technology. I'm bored watching the television. So I go, I'm watching a brilliant thing on the telly at the moment, the new Harlan Coben on Netflix, but I still check my phone. So sometimes you sit there with your laptop open, so you're watching the television, you've got a television, the television then dulls a bit, gets a bit dull, so you check out Facebook. You're never, ever, ever bored. When's the last time you were bored? 03456060973. Almost a Ray Liotta here. James, yes, you can take your phone fishing. I'm currently in a fishing match, and I have you on my phone with an earpiece in. Well, thank you, unsigned texter. But I think part of the appeal of fishing is, is historically to be able to step out of the, the daily grind and actually go, well, I'm not teaching you to fish. I've never done it. Um, 13 minutes after 12 is the time. So when, when were you genuinely, when were you last bored? 03456060973. And... It doesn't actually, I'm just reading a text from Keith. Um, it doesn't have to be a positive. The thing that boredom led you to do that changed your life forever. Keith's been in touch to say, as a bored 15-year-old in 1975, I stole my father's company car and crashed it, changing my life forever. That's not quite what I was looking for, Keith, but goodness me, that's a story, isn't it? So I want to know when you were last bored, but I also want to know what, you are thinking of now as something if technology like the children have got today existed when you were a child what would you never have done oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three is the number that you need and then i suppose because this is such an extraordinary story i want to know about the most outrageous thing you've seen someone doing in a theater not a cinema But some friends of ours went to the theatre in Richmond before Christmas and the people in the row in front brought in a full bag of Kentucky Fried Chicken. I I, I mean, I go to the theatre a lot and standards have dipped a bit over the years. But the thing about Kentucky Fried Chicken is the smell. You can't eat hot food full stop in a theatre, I would argue. But And I said, because I'm weird like this, I said, was it a Zinger burger or, or a chicken fillet? Or did they actually start eating the bones? And she said, I don't, they had the bones. They had the drumsticks. It was like normal KFC. It wasn't burger-based. It was chicken. K- chicken in a theatre. It just sort of, what, what, what are you even thinking? But this fella at, at Hamlet got his laptop out to check his emails. Beat that if you can. 0345 6060 And uh, in the spirit of what would you never have done if you hadn't been bored, I leave you with this thought as we head towards the uh, to the break. James, I was so bored in 1998, I moved to Denmark. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 17 minutes after 12 is the time. Um, uh, You think KFC is bad. I was in the cinema once and a family brought in a rotisserie chicken and proceeded to eat it. I've got no way of fact-checking you, James, in Glasgow, but I don't know why you'd bother making that up. And uh, if someone can take a KFC into a theatre, then I I, I guess a rotisserie chicken. And I don't know why theatre is different from cinema, but it is. So don't, I'm not including cinema in this quest. But after the actor Andrew Scott revealed that he was shocked to see an audience member take out his laptop in the middle of the to-be or not-to-be soliloquy when he was playing Hamlet, I am adding to the list of questions this hour. Um... The most outrageous thing you've seen a, a member of the audience do in a theatre. And and keep it clean. Gary's in Bracknell. Gary, what made you pick up the phone? James, uh, good to talk to you. Uh, first of all, an apology. I've got a bit of a cough at the moment, so <laughs> I may... Don't worry. Thank you for the warning. In a second. That's allowed. Uh, OK, boredom. Um, a bit of context. I left school when I was 15 years old. No qualifications whatsoever. 
And um, um, obviously the employment scene wasn't um, best for me. Um, Mm. I ended up cleaning toilets for a living and um, pretty bored with doing that. So I decided that I was going to go back to college and I went to um, Bracknell College, studied um, software engineering and from there uh, went to university in my late 20s um, at Portsmouth. From there, I went to what's called the Defence Academy at Shrivenham to do a master's degree. From there, in my late 30s, and um, from there, um, I went to do a master's at Oxford University. Um, I don't know. I, I mean, congratulations, and I'm glad that you turned your life around. But I, I, if I'm going to be strict, this isn't what we're looking for, Gary. Is it not? No, I'm t- talking about. I mean, boor, that's a boring job. That's not like a, a, a great expanse of nothingness stretching out in front of you as a child, which you had to then do something to fill. If you'd been, bo- if you'd been so bored as a child that you started <laughs> cleaning the toilet, and then decided that you could design a better brush than the one that your mum had, that would be what I'm looking for this hour. But that's so just that's just having a boring job. No, it's not. It's not what we're looking for at all. No, but that's just boring. <laughs> that would still be boring now. You'd still be bored now if you were cleaning <laughs> toilets. It's not. You haven't forgotten <laughs> how to be bored. You've just changed your job. Oh, I don't. I disagree. Well, you can't I disagree. disagree. I've you, invented you, this game and I've invented the rules. It's oh, literally impossible to game, disagree. <laughs> It's literally okay. impossible. You can't disagree. How can you disagree? That's like disagreeing with God about what the Ten Commandments are. He's told you what the Ten Commandments are. And it's not that. We're not looking for that. You're so bored as a child that you've done something to alleviate the boredom and it's changed your entire life. Like Keith nicked his dad's car. Spent five years in Borstal. I made up the second bit. I don't know quite how that story transpired, but you can see why it might have been life-changing. 20 minutes after 12 is the time. Chris is in Cowbridge in South Wales. Chris, what would you like to say? Uh, hello, James. Thanks for uh, talk to you. And if I may, I'm um, happy New Year. That's the Same to you. to you. Thank you. And and uh, I once again greatly enjoyed rereading or listening to your book again with all the voices. So thank you. Thank you. I'm not so um, sure about the voices. It seems to have divided opinion a bit. I, I was quite pleased with the Anne Widdicombe one, but but some of the others are a little bit maybe a bit immature, Chris. I'm not sure. But we digress. Uh, Tell me about being Paul. Oh well, I, I love your voice for Paul Decker. That's just awesome. <laughs> Um, but anyway, let's just move on. Yes, let's. Um, um, boredom. So you asked, it's basically two questions. So um, I was an only child and I'm autistic. Right. Um, and so I spent quite a lot of time on my own when I was a child. Yes. Um, so there was two things that really helped me when I was uh, bored. I, I got into making models, the old Airfix models. Oh, lovely. Yes. And paint, learning how to paint them and then realising that you should paint them before you put them together as opposed to the other way Oh, around. you were good at it then, weren't you? Mine looked absolutely ridiculous. I might as well have done yeah. them with a sort of house painting brush, the, the <laughs> amount of mess. So you were painting the individual pipes before you glued them to the chassis and stuff like Correct. that. Correct, but also learning not to have glue on your fingers and leaving yep. glue you think it's all about. Never um, learned second, that. The other, and the other part of it was um, getting into reading books. Yes. And... The thing that, and the reason I mention that is that taught me two things. Uh, one, um, it taught me that um, I, I always found something to occupy myself. Yes. I didn't need my parents to find me something to do. I became self reliant on finding something to do. Oh, and also, I discovered self education, um, which has been my founding core for my entire life. Now, that was very young. So I've not really experienced true boredom since I was about six years old because I was always finding things... Now, what do you think, for the counterfactual, if your parents had given you a um, tablet or or a smartphone... How would your life have unfolded differently, I wonder? Because I don't know if you heard the last caller in the last hour whose Mm. daughter is, she thinks, might be autistic. They're awaiting a diagnosis. But she has become effectively addicted to the instant gratification offered up by that sort of technology. That could have been you. Well, we're coming to something which is um, basically impulse control. Yes, that's what it is, isn't it? Yeah. It's impulse control. I mean, the the other thing you asked me was about Mm. the last time I was bored. Yes. Um, and I wouldn't necessarily call it bored in terms of what we're <laughs> discussing, but I was in the pub on Saturday night talking to uh, the barman, and um, the reason I got totally bored is because he was going on about Boris having all the big calls right. But with a straight face? 
Oh, you know, he absolutely believes that Boris is a great laugh and a great prime minister. And I try to say no, no and obviously try to recite the chapter that you talked about, Boris. He just wasn't having it. He just said, no, no, I got all of it because I got absolutely bored in trying to persuade someone that they're absolutely having their next... Well, you couldn't do my uh, job. You couldn't do my job then, Chris. No. No. <laughs> You're oh. supposed to rise to the, relish the challenge. That's the thing there. Do you still make uh, models? I, do you have? A, do you still make um, models, or did you leave that behind? Um, I kind of left that behind probably when I was in my 20s. Because I saw one the other day in a toy shop, and I, I toyed with the idea of buying it and doing trying to do what you did because when I was a child I'm not exaggerating they were just they looked abominable I stopped painting them after a while because they looked better unpainted if I just left them grey but when when you came across someone who knew what they were doing like you tiny little brushes and really lovely detail all that kind of thing um, I, I, I thought I, I did actually find myself thinking I wonder if I could go back to that now but I'd still be rubbish at it Chris that's the problem well, what I got into, um, what the modern making got me into, is I got into Dungeons and Dragons during the eighties. Because and you painted your own figures, and I got into painting the little figures. Yeah. And then I got in when I was in my twenties. I got into buying and selling oh. the painted items to other D and D players. Gosh. And that was in my late teens. So I used to get. And the thing is, my eyesight was much better. But I used to have a big magnifying glass. And I'd spend hours painting these things, mounting them on the little stands. Uh, oh, I think that's what, lovely. But, yeah, and that's what, but you have to have such an eye for detail and a lot of patience. Yes, well, but so, patience is the key, isn't it? I mean, that is really the probably the, the the sister or the cousin of boredom is patience. And so we're talking knitting this hour with the last hour. We're talking about generations of of, of, of people who have no patience, no patience. You're never bored. You don't learn patience, Chris. I could listen to you all day. You tell lovely stories. Thank you. 12.25 is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Brian sounds like a bit of a gent. He says, I'm currently sitting entirely on my own, sat, I beg your pardon, entirely on my own in a gentleman's club in central London. I wonder if it's that sort of club or that sort of club. Are we talking Pall Mall or are we talking Stringfellows? Uh, <laughs> I'm waiting for open reach to complete some works on the exchange. I reiterate, there is no one else here. If it wasn't for your radio programme, I'd be bored. And that's from Brian, who's usually in Boreham Wood but he's currently in, in central London because uh, obviously the exchange is down, so you've got no, you've got no data. You can't, you can't log on. If you can't log on, you're bored. Luckily, here I am on the radio. Chris is in Worcester. Chris, what would you like to say? Uh, good afternoon, James. Right. Um, I was so bored around about nearly 10 years ago that I end up qualifying as an American football referee. Well, this doesn't, I'm being so strict. This doesn't count. You weren't a child. Oh. Oh, okay. this is just adults <laughs> boasting about their achievements. That's my job. I oh, cover no. that. I've got that covered on this program. It's something you were bored because you weren't bored ten years ago. You could easily have gone online and played a game or done something else. You just saw something that you quite fancied doing. Ah, well, before that, I refereed for twenty years in the FA, which I actually did that when I was a sixteen-year-old kid because I wanted to get involved in sport. That's better. So, so that's I better. Kind of did my twenty years of that. Took a few years off because I wasn't enjoying it anymore because of the parents. Yeah. Um, and this latest official I do actually led me to work for the NFL at Wembley. Oh, on I love the that. See, that's bench. exciting. That's exciting, but it's not. It's not sadly a consequence of having been bored. It's just a consequence of having developed an ambition like our toilet cleaning friend. Uh, I suppose you need to have been listening to know uh, what, what I'm referring to there. But um, but it's not. It's got to be. You were bored as a child. In Boreham Wood, appropriately enough, in Brian's case. You were bored as a child, and it, and it, it prompted you to take something up that you never would have done otherwise. Um, uh, I once got so bored, James, that I started reading one of your books. See, that's not the gag you think it is, is it? You see, you, wanted, you, should, you should have said, I, last time I was bored, I was reading this book called How They Broke Britain. Goodness knows how it's become a massive bestseller and is still in the Amazon charts nine weeks after being released. You could say, because I found it really boring. Uh, Jonathan's in Finchley. Jonathan, what would you like to say? Yeah. Hi, uh, yeah, I was, um, over Christmas, I was in Istanbul visiting my wife's family, and I decided not to take any screens with me, so ah, I just I just okay. went there with books and, and a notepad. Uh, it was an intentional thing. Yeah. And so you didn't I even take your phone? Different. No, no phone, Crikey. no screens, nothing. Yeah, did, you, what, did you worry about, like, family needing to get hold of you if someone was poorly? Were there emergency well, channels they could have come down? If yeah, they yeah, my wife, my wife had her phone. Okay, so, fair you know, enough. Yeah. wanted to get hold of me. Um, and yeah, it was a mixed bag, I would say, um, in a sense that, you know, there was a lot of time where I didn't know what to do with myself mm. and 
and you know and i i was, I was like i said to myself oh i'm bored this is all it's like um and i kind of deliberately wanted to experience it um so you know i just i just sat there sometimes just doing nothing for a bit for the first time and in then, in years yeah i mean i've done it i did it before i did it in the summer as well really it was much it was much easier in the summer because i could go swimming i was in the beach i could go swimming yeah. i was with my with my family uh but i i was with, my son was there as well he's, he's almost 17 and i had an amazing connection with him because i was just present i'm normally just you know I speak to him and then the phone vibrates and i go off somewhere else and and you're not there everybody. so it works yeah. it works it's a healthy it thing really to do. works it really, really worked. We had a really lovely connection. We had meals together. We went for walks. Do you itch a bit? Do, in the first day or yeah. the first couple of days, are you kind of, you've got that sense of, what, what, what's missing? I should be doing that. I want to yeah. do this. I'm reaching yeah. for it. Re I'm almost reaching re my pocket. Yeah. Yeah, but, but there's another side to it, which is when I got when I went out for the day and I got back in the evening, I, there was like a relief at not having to look at my phone ah. because, it, you know, it, 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 it's an emotional sort of... Uh, Crutch. Um, yeah, no, not crush. It it, it um, stimulates emotions. They're oh, not always great. Yeah. No, of course you not. You know, uh, you know, concern, and you get addicted worry, to distraction. That, whether it's positive yeah. or negative, your, yes, your body's exactly. saying, "Where's that lovely chemical gone?" So my dopamine levels are really flat. You know, which in a good way. Which they has got to be a good thing. Which means you're only getting yeah. excited about exciting things. Yeah, or just being more present. I was just more present. It's a great you word. Know? I like that. Karma. Thank yeah. you. I love that. Thank you. I, I I also wonder, looking at some of the texts coming in. Do children still have imaginary friends? Or or is that, if you've got a phone, a screen, a tablet, you probably don't need them. I know some people don't let their children access the technology until they're older, but the amount of people you see in push chairs and prams now uh, uh, who've been given their mum's phone or their use, I don't know whether or not you would have imaginary friends. Uh, Amelia Cox is here now with your headlines. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.34 is the time. I, I once had a job collecting marshmallows at the end of a production line. I taught myself to micro-sleep while standing, and nobody cared, says Carl in Liverpool. I, oh, crikey. I like Jonathan's call, um, because that gave me pause I, when he uses that word present. I've deleted a couple of apps when I've been on holiday, but I've never quite reached the point, and I won't take my phone to the beach. I'll leave it in the hotel or, the, or, or, or you know, wherever we're staying, the villa. Um, but that word present, it's one of those weird words. Sometimes when words appear in conversation that you didn't use a lot when you were younger, you think they're suspect, don't you? We don't need to use that. You know, coming to a new word. Um, but sometimes they're really, they're really helpful. We didn't use the word present. But you know exactly what he means. It doesn't mean present in the same way that you would shout that when a teacher read your name out of the register. Are you here? Oh, Brian, present. Yes, sir. Here's yes, a present, sir. Uh, it means present present. It means not just physically present, but mentally present, emotionally present, intellectually present. And the child really notices that, I think. But of course, the conversation began with us wondering about the amount of time that children are not present, because a teacher's telling us about them not being present in class. So it cuts both ways. Um, I love the idea of boredom um, taking you to somewhere that you would not be in today if you hadn't been bored as a child i don't know that i explained that very well initially because a couple of people obviously got the wrong end of the stick for which i take full responsibility but it's not about career changes it's about that almost what's the word i'm looking for it's an almost transcendental level of boredom that you have as a child you have nothing else to do there was i don't think people could understand this there was nothing on television and you didn't if you even if you had a video recorder you only had about four tapes and you could only watch the great escape or the wizard of oz so many times or last week's top of the pops so you're just bored you're bored brainless so you do something just to alleviate the boredom and now looking back 30 40 years later you're thinking do you know what if it had if i hadn't been that bored but i don't think i'd be doing this today but then again, I've come up with no examples at all of my own. So maybe it was a stupid question in the first place. I, I couldn't blame you for being bored. It's 12.36, is the number that you need. Uh, David's in Camberley. David, what made you pick up the phone? Yeah, good morning. Great show, by the way. It's um, all right. Some people are quite I bored, to... I suspect. Carry on. <laughs> Absolutely. I picked up the phone because um, I was 15 years old up at Heathrow Airport, doing plane spotting, looking at the planes, which I did quite often as a 15-year-old kid. 
And I got bored of plane spotting. Right. So I started looking at the aircraft on the ground and how the people were actually engaging the aircraft on the ground. And I noticed all these people in blue ovals. And then I noticed one person <laughs> in green ovals. And I said, what's the guy doing in green ovals? And one of the people in the crowd I was with said, oh, he's an apprentice. Right. And as a 15-year-old lad, not knowing what I wanted to do when I still left school, I suddenly had that light bulb moment. I wanted to be an engineering apprentice for British Airways. Oh, that's nice. And um, as a 15-year-old lad, I applied to British Airways, and I got accepted and started as a 16-year-old lad. I got fully trained. I'm now 64 years old. I've been all around the world. I'm still with British Airways. Fantastic career. But it all started because I was bored. Plane spotting right, I, yeah, I, I mean that's a brilliant one. It's the best. It's the best yet on, on, on in terms of what I was looking for. But it's still not exactly what I was looking for, is it? Because you were you were plane spotting. It's just weird that you got a bit bored of your hobby that day. It's not that you weren't doing anything. Do you remember what it was like when when you just you just sort of you could you just couldn't imagine the evening ever coming. It was just there was just so much emptiness in a day. It, it was. I just never. I just never saw. Uh, that opportunity, and, no. and I hadn't. If I hadn't gone to the Heathrow Airport, yes, I love that. I love, and, and and well, you must be you must be hanging up your whatever it is your overalls soon. Nearly, yes. Well, hang in there. That's a, quite a story, actually. That's quite a quite a quite a shift. Uh, Twelve thirty-eight is the time. Um, if I hadn't been bored as a kid, I never would have found the joy of cricket, listening, playing, watching, scoring, umpiring. It's the gift that keeps on giving. As a kid, I played imaginary matches with dice or with a ball bounced off the walls in indoor or out, and you could do that on your own. I I, I did that as well. You could do. I do fill the time as well, especially if we moved house when I was about ten, and and I didn't have neighbours to play with. I couldn't go and knock on anyone's door and ask for a game of football or a game of cricket. So. You would find these astonishing ways. I wonder what sort of damage it does to us not not having that capacity to be bored, apart from the patience element of it. Balama is in Lambeth. Balama, what would you like to say? No, thank you, James, uh, for taking my call and lovely to speak to you again. Well, you normally ring me on rather more highfalutin matters than this, Balama. <laughs> the thing, James, is that you are so skilled as, at uh, forcing people to pick up their phones. <laughs> I never thought I would talk Not on these kinds of issues. Thank you. Uh, yeah, but I mean, um, when you ask this question, I am going to try to attempt your second, not the first, which is the more difficult question. Yes. Um, I remember that I was last bored on Wednesday, and uh, <laughs> it, it went to the extent of sending a message to my WhatsApp group asking for suggestions. Um, so I, I sent out this message at uh, 122 to my SOAS PhD WhatsApp group uh, saying, having submitted my draft uh, thesis recently, I find myself a bit bored today. Any suggestions for activities on or off campus? Uh, so this was the message I sent uh, on Wednesday, but it was because of an accumulation of like three factors, one of which uh, speaks directly to this program. Yes. Uh, about two years ago, I realized how consuming social media could be. Uh, it is almost impulsive if you have the phone close to you, you are seated on your table. Mm. Uh, every few minutes, your hand just, uh, I mean, impulsively goes to the phone and you start clicking on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, or yeah. another app and uh, spend a lot of time. And I found myself doing that during the lockdown. So I made a deliberate decision to remove all social media apps from my phone. Yes. Uh, I do download social media apps on Sundays, and I would explain why I do that. But uh, aside of Sundays, I would remove them uh, on Monday morning and then... Uh, would, would it, if you hadn't done that, genuinely, do you think it would have taken you longer to finish your PhD? It would have taken me longer to finish my PhD, but also because I do a part-time PhD and on a full-time job, it would make one less oh, productive. Yes, of course it and would. It, it's even more personal, James. It's not about time wasting and, and, uh, alone, but it's also about bullying, about, mm. uh, I mean, a false life or fake life on social media that can leave impact on the mind of people, especially young people. In my case, uh, for example, on Sundays, I do... Is a, a Facebook show for Northern Nigerian audiences uh, in Hausa language. Hausa is the second largest language in Africa. Yes. And I do this uh, show that is watched by hundreds of thousands of people every week. Uh, last time I checked the 
uh, Facebook stats that they said uh, people have watched my show for 12 million minutes in the last 90 days. <laughs> That's all right. So, <laughs> but what, what that brings, uh, uh, James, is controversies. People will have opinions of you. They would make videos about you. They would say things you never knew about you. Some would make you laugh. Others will have a lasting impact on you. And when I saw that affecting me, I said, look, no, I just need to remove these and oh, people wow. can see what they, yeah. Okay. So uh, that's part of it. But uh, the second thing that made me, uh, made my boredom uh, on Wednesday was the fact that I recently submitted my PhD and what I used my Christmas period over the past four years because I was on a, uh, on a part-time PhD was to use the New Year and Christmas break to write chapters. And I submitted my last chapter uh, in December, and uh, that's before Christmas. And therefore, there was little to do um, when Christmas came. <laughs> so, and you, then, yeah, so you're freewheeling. You've, got, you've had your brain so full, and then you don't know what to do to fill it up again. Exactly. And then there was no James O'Brien, because at a point I was asking myself whether you are addicted, because... There are, uh, whether <laughs> I, you could be addicted to me. Well, there are there are hours <laughs> of, available on the Global Player, Balama, as you well know. So you could, there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's an endless supply. It's very important never to get high on your own supply. Thank you, mate. Always good to talk to you, even, even on unexpected topics like this one. But I want to squeeze in one or two more before we try and uh, make contact with a, with a, um, a, a chap in Gaza who's um, there by accident, really. He was visiting family when the attack started and has, has stayed there. I, I'm just keen to know what it's like on the ground from people actually there. 12.43 is the time. I get this. Boredom is watching Bergerac in the afternoon so that the day will hurry up and you can watch the afternoon edition of Neighbours. And Obi put this really well about just not being able to explain it to a child. Um... Uh, it, not being able to explain to a child what, what boredom actually is um, and uh, d- d- remembering lying on a bed in the back garden just looking at ants. Carol Vorderman is listening. Carol kept you company over that Christmas period and will hopefully be keeping you company a little bit more in the in the year ahead, but who knows? I was so bored as a child, she says, I used to sit on the wall at the bottom of our road in Prestatin in the 1960s and watch the cars and write down the registration numbers in my little book, Vowels, Consonants and Numbers. That's why she was so good on Countdown for 26 years, perhaps. And then the car passed a a second or third time. I'd make a tally chart and notes, more maths, and lo and behold, an engineering degree from Cambridge. So that that is actually the perfect example, although she couldn't prove that those childhood boredom alleviations led to either Cambridge University or to Countdown. But um, but, but it's certainly possible, isn't it? It's coming up to quarter to one. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Um, back today, uh, I just, just returned, a scientist from Manchester, who has just returned to the UK after spending two months under bombardment by the Israeli forces in Gaza. We'll be able to, uh, I mean, significantly and somewhat embarrassingly provide us with the first first-hand, first-person account of what it is actually like to be there at this um, at this dreadful time. He, and he's coming up after this. It's 12.45. James O'Brien on LBC. James O'Brien on LBC. 12.48 is the time, and you are listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Make of it what you will, but it was easier, much, much easier, to speak to, and remains much, much easier to speak to people in Ukraine about the bombardments, the Russian bombardments there, than it has been and continues to be, to speak to people in Gaza about the Israeli bombardments there. I I mentioned that by way of exculpation, really, for for not having done before what we're about to do now, albeit that Mohamed Galagini, a scientist from Manchester, is now back in the UK, just back in in the last 24 hours, I think, after spending two months under bombardment by Israeli forces in Gaza. Mohammed, thank you for your time this afternoon. Hi, hi James. Thank you for thank you for having me on. And I I, I would be very happy to offer uh, assistance in getting more voices from Gaza on if you if you're committed to it. I mean, it's it's hard but not impossible. Yeah, and you're on. I think it's an important part of the conversation. Hearing voices from Gaza it categorically is stay on stay on the line. We're, we're, when we've finished, we'll take you up on that offer and we'll thank you for it. Um, you were there visiting family, I think, when the uh, well, first of all, when the terror attack on October the seventh occurred, and then when the uh, consequent Israeli attack on Gaza followed. What, what was your first moment of realization about what you had found yourself caught up in? Um, I think it was, it was, um, 
I guess realizing the the rocket attacks, um, you know, going from Gaza to Israel were quite uh, numerous, uh, going on for about an hour, and that's when I think that was the moment of realization. Then after that, kind of just seeing some of the some of the um, footage, I guess, coming through through from the border uh, of like Hamas fighters kind of uh, attacking the Israeli military across the border, um, and we left our home um, immediately on on the seventh of October because um, at my my mother's apartment in in Gaza is on the beach and it's a very exposed location. So uh, anyone that lives either either on near the sea or near the border, uh, they're the first to evacuate. And um, and, and where do you go? Been, where, where do you go? Been, so there'd been a bombing next next to our apartment that brought down many of our windows. We we went. Immediately, in the, the immediate sense, we went to a, an apartment that belonged to a friend of ours nearby. Then, um, then, kind of, it was a succession of of, of evacuations from that apartment to um, to um, my father's place, then to a hotel uh, in North Gaza that we thought might be safe. Uh, it wasn't. Um, then, on the thirteenth of October, we uh, based on. I guess this order from the IDF that um, was, you know, not not a legal order, but but we were terrified for 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 our lives and safety. So we followed the instructions to go south to Khan Yunis, where my uh, my um, late grandparents' house is, um, and sheltered in Khan Yunis for uh, close to six or seven weeks, actually. Um, and um, I guess like every every step of the way. We were taking what we felt we might need uh, to survive, and kind of building, building, building. Um, I guess a household infrastructure in yes. terms of like ability to to cook, in terms of having like a water storage um, and um, and furniture. And every time you move, you have to carry that with you. Or, or a subset of it because it's not always possible to take everything uh, and get everyone everyone out at the same time and and what was the i mean this you were moving it in a in a sea of people a tide of you were part of a tide of people making similar journeys making similar um movements yes yes the the um, close to 90 percent of gaza's population has been on the move in the last two months, and, and currently, something like almost close to me, two million people are now out of their homes, um, and it created massive strains on 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 people in terms of being able to find find the like water supply. The water supply was cut off by by Israel very early on. Uh, being able to or the electricity was cut off, and water relies on relies on electricity to be pumped, um, and then accessing basic necessities like food in terms of like flour like the price of flour went from 40 shekels before the before uh the israeli bombardment up to some people are paying close to a thousand shekels now for for a for a bag of flour just to give you give you an idea um and you know it's this there's obviously the massive uh toll in human life that uh you know, some some experts in genocide have have stated that a geno- Israel is conducting a genocide, and the Israeli Israeli um, officials have been making genocidal statements, like you know, quoting Netanyahu quoting verses from the Bible saying, "You must kill every man, woman, and child, every donkey, uh, destroy their houses." Um, and I, I mean, you, you, you know, I have to remind you that some experts in the field of genocide have also disputed the use of that word in this context. But it is increasingly hard to, to challenge the use of the of the word ethnic cleansing because the, the, the movement of people, your family and you for a period among them from an area where they have lived into an area where they will seek shelter while the area in which they lived is rendered uninhabitable. I think that's something that perhaps we're missing over here is that the, these are areas to which nobody's going to be able to move back anytime soon. And that presumably is part of the plan. 
Yeah, so I think I think the International Criminal Court and the International uh, Court for Justice will will ultimately um, tell what is happening. But ultimately, the, pro- the problem is whether we whether it is genocide or mass killing. In the end, hundreds of Palestinians are being killed every day. Ten a child every ten minutes was the, was the uh, nearly the, nearly ten thousand children in total already. Yeah. Yeah, so so I think ultimately it doesn't matter what we call it. Ultimately, it has to stop. We we need a well. It matters. Need... I don't want to get bogged down in the semantics, but it matters in the context of Holocaust and 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 previous genocide, and and it matters in the context of what words really really mean. But we know what numbers but, mean, and we know that nearly ten I mean, ten thousand. I mean, I think, I think no, but I think I, I, I have a, I have a I understand semantic or legal legalistic differences, but like in the end, I think it's important to not dismiss. I'm not saying that you're dismissing, but like you know, by by dismissing the the term genocide, for example, uh, does that belittle the 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 deaths of 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 close to twenty two thousand Palestinians now? Um, I mean, the Israel uh, claimed that seventh the seventh of October was a in quote genocidal attack. Mm. So it's kind of um, what why why but, why? And, and, well, look, I, I said I didn't want to get bogged down in this. And if someone did that to me in this context, I would challenge that use of that word in the same in the same way. So let, 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 let's focus on actions ra- rather than words, if we can. And the. That, I mean, the simple fear, the visceral fear in, under which everybody, lucky enough to have a roof over their head, continues to live. Ab- absolutely. Not knowing, like now, I, you know, I, I, people have been asking me, how does it feel to be back in the UK? And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm elated, but I'm also devastated to, to be here. I, I, I am safe now, physically. I'm not mentally safe. No. And I am so, so fearful for, for my friends, my family that I've left behind. And, I, and you know, I, I, worry what the ping of my phone will bring in terms of like news but i also like worry for the the intense struggle for survival that everyone is experiencing you know the winter is here now so many people are are in inadequate shelter in overcrowded uh, un schools um like friends of mine uh, you know, that are saying in classrooms that have 50, 60, 70 people in them, uh, seven or 800 people to a toilet block. Um, and 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 the, the fear, the fear that we have is that as Gaza has been made uninhabitable, you know, by by Israel's attack, as you know, as as hospitals have been rendered clinics rather than hospitals, mm. as basic civilian infrastructure has been, has been bombed basic infrastructure of governance like the parliament building the courts building have been destroyed uh, that then raises the real fear of palestinians in gaza being pushed into sinai and and not being allowed back to um to um to gaza but then add to that you know people who are now living in gaza will be will be um at risk of death from disease and like you know easily treatable diseases in a normal context that, that you know that the, the public health officials have warned that the death toll from disease could dwarf that from the bombing and israel and israel's supporters such as the uk government and the us government and uh, uk labor party who who've who've not called for a ceasefire are complicit in that um, we're going to run out of time. You're welcome to come back tomorrow if you can. I, I, I don't want you to feel in any way curtailed or, or, or cut off. Sure. But before you do yeah. go, the, the leaflets have now started falling in Han Yunus telling people, where, where do they go next? Because you've described an exodus that your family undertook. Where, where, where do they I mean, go the, next? So so when I, I left Khan Yunus and Rafah was the only, Rafah or the land to the west of Khan Yunus were, were the only options. Rafah is massively overcrowded and mm. the land to the west of Khan Yunus is agricultural sand dunes that cannot support life so so it, there is a real fear of being pushed closer and closer to sinai and and that needs to not that needs to stop and not happen we need a ceasefire immediately and to work towards a political process um uh, a lasting sustainable political process we, we we need to be realistic about uh wanting peace and working towards it
Uh, Mohammed, as I say, we, we, we I'd, I'd love to talk to you again if that's not the wrong verb to yeah, use. Sure. But, but I feel okay. that I feel that there is some. I know you have other other um, uh, uh, appointments. But Mohammed Galliani, a scientist from Manchester, just returned to the UK after spending two months under bombardment by Israeli forces in Gaza. I'll read out a text from Laura because I think it again highlights how difficult it is for us to do our job in these circumstances. Laura's been in touch to say, will you now be speaking to someone who was in Israel on October the 7th to ask them what it was like? No, didn't think so. Um, I, I, we're talking about stuff that's happening now. That's, that's news. And we will talk about stuff that happened in the past. We did then when that was news. But goodness me, to listen to a man telling a story like that and to be looking to score... I don't know what you'd even call them. It's, it's a strange place to find yourself in. It's one o'clock. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Up next, Sheila Fogarty. If you missed any of today's show, you can listen back to it on Global Player. You can pause, rewind live radio. All LBC's shows are there, as well as the best video clips from LBC and other global stations. Remember, you can pause and rewind live radio on Global Player, where you're always in control. Download it for free from your app store or head to globalplayer.com. Coming up at four on LBC, it's Tom Swarbrick, but now here's Sheila. James O'Brien on LBC.